<laughs> There's a step over here. Welcome. Good morning. Yes. I'll call this meeting to order. Uh, good morning. My name is Paul Van Kanenenberg. Uh, Doug Remedios, will you call the roll for the Transportation Commissioners? Thank you. Would the CARB uh, clerk please call the roll of CARB board members, please? Dr. Bonds? Here. Mr. Del Torre? Mm -hmm. Mr. Eisenhut? Here. Thank you everyone for attending this morning and welcome to Modesto and it's like, we like to say everything you liked in your youth came from Stanislaus County. Uh, your candy bar was made here. Your favorite movie was conceived here. This is the second of two annual joint meetings this year. The first meeting was in 2000, of 2019 was held in Sacramento back in April. This is a very important meeting today. In the past month, the governor has issued an executive order directing state agencies to take further action in climate change. He has signed a Assembly Bill 185, which requires a representative from the Department of Housing and Community Development to be included in our joint meetings starting next year. And he has appointed two new commissioners, Tamika Butler, Tamika, if you would raise your hand, and Hillary Norton. Welcome, Tamika and Hillary. We have a new Secretary of California Transportation Agency, Secretary David Kim. I don't believe he has joined us yet this morning. He had some phone calls. This is his first joint meeting. The governor has also announced the appointment of a new director of Caltrans, uh, Tokes Omashakin, who will be begin later this month. We look forward to meeting him. Commissioner Lucy Dunn is fond of saying, Homes are where jobs go to sleep at night, and the closer people live to where they work, the less time and effort they spend on their commute. AB 185 expands the focus of these joint meetings to coordinate the implementation of policies that jointly affect transportation, air quality, and housing. While this change is not effective until next year, we are excited to begin including housing sector into our conversations. Zachary Olmsted, Deputy Director of Housing Policy for HCD is at the meeting today. Zachary, please raise your hand. Hi, Zach. And we'll provide a presentation on the state's housing requirements. I would like to take a moment to mention the following, uh, the following uh, uh, finalization of the Safer, Affordable, Efficient Vehicle Rule, the SAFE Rule, on September 19th. The Commission will, uh, is looking at hosting a public workshop in the future to, di to discuss the potential impacts to transportation deli project delivery. I'm looking forward to the presentations we have today, including an up update on the Safe Vehicles Rule, an overview of Governor Newsom's recent executive order, and a panel discussion on sustainable transportation planning and project, project implementation in the San Joaquin Valley. I will now introduce Chair Nichols, and thank Chair Nichols for the meeting we had at the beginning of June here in Modesto, where a lot of um, uh, we had some successful outcomes on dealing with uh, sustainable transportation planning here in the Valley. So thank you, Chair Nichols, for all of your help. Uh, thank you also. I guess this is on, right? 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Um, well, first of all, I also would like to welcome the two new commissioners, uh, both fellow Southern Californians. It's great to see you here. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you to achieve the state's vision of a future where all Californians have access to a range of affordable transportation and housing options that increase access to economic opportunity, reduce greenhouse gas emissions, and promote <clears throat> community resiliency. The convenings that we've had uh, to date between our two boards have, I think, improved coordination and communication between our two agencies, as was evidenced by our workshop back in May on the federal government's rollback of national emissions standards by sharing information and common concerns in that venue and an ongoing conversation since then We've made California's position on that matter stronger and certainly improved um, our voice, uh, made our voice heard more successfully uh, at the national level. On that topic, I do want to update folks on our ongoing battles uh, against the Trump administration's effort to dismantle programs that protect public health and cut air pollution while increasing consumer choice and reducing fuel costs. Uh, in mid-September, the Trump administration finalized the safe vehicle rule, as it's called, and in doing so, they withdrew or purported to withdraw California's Clean Air Act waiver for our greenhouse gas and zero emission vehicle standards. These standards so far have been in effect, in the years that they've been effect, in effect, have not only improved air quality, but they've also driven innovation and prevented some serious pollution-related public health impacts. Furthermore, the benefits extend beyond California to 13 other states and the District of Columbia that have adopted California's standards. The reasons that the administration has cited for taking this action defy reality. They claim that cutting the standards will reduce vehicle prices, which is wrong. The EPA's own analysis shows that consumers will save money under the current existing standards. They also say that revoking the waiver will make cars safer. And this is just nonsense. We don't need to make cars more polluting to make them safer. We need to make them safer. And their legal preemption arguments aren't any better. I don't want to spend more time debating uh, the merits of the case, but just to say that um, there's really been no change in terms of the stance that the administration is taking, unfortunately, uh, and therefore uh, there are consequences for us and for the CTC and for the Metropolitan Planning Organizations and other stakeholders who may be here or tuning in today. We will be required to take action, and I'm confident that we can and will confront the challenge, particularly related to air quality conformity. While the federal action does not identify any immediate issues about conformity, they just don't say anything about it, we recognize that there are serious issues here, and as such, we've established an interagency coordination group, and we will be reaching out to transportation agencies and other stakeholders to identify near and longer term issues. We're confident that we can work together to address them and we will be able to identify solutions, but it's going to take some work. Now I also want to say a word about our host region. I'm really glad that we're having today's meeting here in the San Joaquin Valley because while this region faces some unique and difficult air quality and transportation challenges, the Air District and other agencies and levels of government have really worked hard to continually produce air quality improvements over the last 15 years. And I think it's important that we recognize that fact that while we have a ways to go, quite a ways to go, to meet standards, we have continually made progress at whittling away at this problem despite uh, many challenges, including uh, growth in vehicle miles traveled. CARB and the local air district are collaborating closely to implement the current uh, particulate matter standards for the Valley that were adopted last January. Our efforts are focusing on ensuring that we're making progress continually. Uh, implementation is underway, but we have a lot of work to do. As we've said, we're working on strengthening rules, funding incentive programs, which everybody recognizes must be funded, and accelerating transportation planning and implementation to advance air quality and climate goals. 
So to that end, I'm looking forward to hearing from the Valley MPOs about some of the transformative and innovative projects that they are implementing as part of their sustainable community strategies pursuant to SB 375. And again, these are projects that have multiple benefits associated with them. So it's really good that we're able to um, recognize the framework that was established in 375 with CARB setting targets, but then the strategies allowing and encouraging MPOs and local governments to define their own destiny, choosing the strategies that get them to their target in the way that makes most sense for their local region and also help to illuminate their goals and visions for their communities. Finally, I want to acknowledge Governor Newsom's recent landmark executive order, which will help the state continue to lead on climate as well as deliver further reductions from the transportation sector. This order addresses one of the key opportunity areas that were recognized in our recent uh, report that we filed under Senate Bill 150, which is to align our transportation and housing policies and investments to support climate, air quality, health, equity, and economic goals. So this is all about implementation. Where, as the governor said in New York when he spoke at the Climate Week uh, in front of the nations of the world, we are building on all of the goals and targets that we've set and all of the policies, but now this is about implementation. So looking forward to the discussion and uh, to the whole agenda. Thank you very much. And now I'll pass the baton back. Thank you, Chair Nichols. Um, so the CTC exists to make transportation planning, funding, and policy more understandable and accountable. We welcome comments from the public. The public comment agenda item is scheduled for 1 PM. However, that it could m come forward or move back. Those who wish to make public comments, we ask that they fill out a speaker card and give it to Doug Remedios. Doug, could you raise your hand? Please do your best to be concise with your comments. Since we often have many speakers, we may limit your, your uh, comment period to anywhere from one to three minutes, depending on how many speakers we have. Doug, would you please give us a brief safety briefing? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Ladies and gentlemen, if there is an emergency, there are exit doors on either side of there, over here. Please exit the building out to the green area out in front of the, the community center and await further instruction. If you have a medical emergency, please bring it to our attention. We will call 911 and have emergency responders come to you where you're at. If you have any questions, please let me know. Thank you, Doug. I'd like to acknowledge Secretary Kim has now joined the meeting. Thank you, Secretary Kim. If anyone hasn't met him, that's who he is. <laughs> I'd now like to ask Director Susan Branson of the California Transportation Commission to offer comments. Well, I'm going to keep my comments rather brief. I uh, wanted to give you all an update on the Commission's um, effort to develop guidelines for the next round of funding for the Commission's discretionary programs, the Active Transportation Program, the Congested Quarters Program, the Local uh, Partnership Program, and the Solutions for Congested Quarters Program. Um, these, uh, we have made a decision to uh, move out the date for adopting guidelines to ensure that our guidelines will uh, align with the Transportation Agency's uh, Freight Mobility Plan. And so in doing that, we are in the process of writing guidelines where the plan is that the congested quarters program guidelines would be adopted in January of 2020, and all the other uh, competitive program guidelines would be adopted in March 2020. And this is a very important time for all of us to work together as we put those guidelines uh, in place and bring those to the commission for adoption because those are the guidelines that will help us in achieving the state's goals and objectives with regards to uh, climate change, housing, but also mobility, safety, our, our just our overall environmental goals and our economy, and so much more. So um, we have been holding public workshops, and we just encourage all of you to participate in those and help us inform and get those guidelines right. I also wanted to just take the opportunity to thank our respective staffs 
that put together uh, this meeting that we're having today. A lot of work goes into these meetings, and I just want to thank all of you that have helped us uh, bring forward a good a good program today, a good a good meeting, and also our presenters. Just want to thank you for preparing and for being here today, and also to the Valley for hosting us. So with that, Mr. Terrell, pass it back. Thank you, Director Branson. Now I'll call on California Air Resources Board Executive Officer Richard Corey. Yes, thanks, Vice Chair. And as noted, we're pleased to be here. And I really look forward to hearing from today's speakers about the transportation, housing, and air quality challenges we face and how we're partnering to identify solutions. Chair Nichols highlighted the Trump administration's attack on California's authority. But the attacks didn't end with a safe rule. We received a letter a few weeks ago from US EPA Administrator Wheeler suggesting that EPA would impose federal highway funding sanctions outlined in the Clean Air Act for what Mr. Wheeler described as California's failure to carry out its air quality responsibilities under the Act. As evidence of this claim, the EPA Administrator looks to EPA's backlog of California State Implementation Plans, or SIPs, a backlog created by EPA's failure to act on SIP submissions. Administrator Wheeler's letter appeared only days after EPA attacked our state's authority on car emissions, and as Chair Nichols noted, an act that will increase air pollution while also limiting our ability to reduce it. The letter from US EPA contains multiple inaccuracies, omissions, and misstatements. EPA failed to act on these submittals for years and is now threatening California regarding paperwork issues of its own creation. We've been working in a very methodical manner with staff at EPA to reduce their backlog, and will continue to do so. But EPA also needs to do its job and protect air quality. California and other states had to go to court repeatedly to get the EPA to implement the strict smog standards it claims to be worried about. Regarding the federal highway sanctions referred to in EPA's letter and provided for in the Clean Air Act, these sanctions govern all our work on SIP submittals and implementation of those SIPs. This is nothing new. As I mentioned, we'll continue to work with EPA to reduce the backlog and to achieve approval of the California SIPs before them. California has met federal air quality standards in the past, and we're working hard to meet the current ones. But we cannot get there until the federal government addresses emissions of federally regulated mobile sources, including heavy-duty trucks, locomotives, planes, and ships. The proportion of emissions from these sources will increase in the future as emissions from sources under California's authority continues to drop. With all that said, I'd like to focus briefly on how CARB is working with its partners to improve air quality and protect public health, particularly here in the Valley, which has a unique set of air quality and transportation challenges. We at CARB are committed to helping this region overcome these challenges through incentives, regulations, and key strategic partnerships. The remainder of my remarks this morning will highlight some of the ways that we're working to help the Valley reduce emissions and improve air quality while also contributing to healthy and sustainable communities. To date, the Valley has received hundreds of millions of dollars through CARB's broad portfolio of incentive programs. These programs advance the zero emission light duty vehicle market clean transportation equity projects, clean heavy-duty vehicles and off-road equipment, and cutting-edge demonstration technologies. They also influence the many sectors that are important to the economy and to the character of the Valley, including freight, the agricultural industry, and transportation. A few projects and programs worth, worth mentioning include one right here in Modesto, where 15 million in cap-and-trade dollars are funding heavy-duty battery, electric trucks, as well as low NOx trucks that will run on renewable natural gas. The Prop 1B program has also delivered $188 million to the Valley, funding cleaner trucks, locomotives, and transportation uh, refrigeration units. In the agricultural sector, the farmer program funds cleaner vehicles and equipment used in agricultural operations like tractors, trucks, and pumps. The Community Air Protection Incentive Program funds clean air projects in the most impacted communities in the Valley. Over 60% of the $80 million appropriated so far has been committed to projects funding off-road agricultural equipment, 
locomotives, and school buses, including 22 zero emission school buses. As CARB looks for ways to help clean up the valley air, it also considers new regulations to facilitate advancements in zero and near zero emission technologies and to encourage turnover of dirty buses and trucks. For example, we have an advanced truck regulation that will come before our board in December and the board already adopted the innovative clean transit regulation last December. Both rules will spur development of zero emission trucks and buses. We know that we can't do this work alone. We rely on key strategic partnerships to be successful. Our incentive programs especially depend on partnerships with the air districts, community-based organizations, as well as other state, regional, and local agencies like those here today. Working together is essential to ensure that these programs provide meaningful benefits in the communities we serve. This underscores the importance of these joint meetings. By getting together a couple times a year, we're far better able to learn from partner and partner with one another and support one another as well. And it's worth noting these joint ventures are not only taking place between our two agencies. Last week, I was in the Valley for a joint Senate Bill 100 scoping workshop with the Public Utilities Commission and the Energy Commission. While we have a lot of work to do to clean up the air here in the Valley, there's clearly great work underway. And we're pleased to be a partner in the effort to reduce emissions, improve air quality and public health, and enhance resilient and sustainable communities. We're striving to create additional opportunities to clean the air and advance sustainable transportation in the Valley and throughout the state. And with that, I end my remarks. Thank you. Thank you. We'll now move to our next topic. It's an update on the uh, safe vehicle rule. Uh, Craig Siegel with the California Air Resources Board. Raise your hand, Craig, so everyone knows who you are. And Darwin Musavi from the California State Transportation Agency. Raise your hand. There you go. And Tanisha Taylor from the California Association of Councils of Government it, are here and going to give us an update. So, Craig, we'll start with you. And I will just ask that uh, commissioners and board members will hold your questions to the end, write them down, and then we'll have a question and answer period at the end of their pre their, all three of their presentations. Thank you. Go ahead, Craig. All right. Well, good morning, everyone. I'm Craig Holt Siegel. I'm Assistant Chief Counsel of the California Air Resources Board, and I'm glad to be here with Darwin and Tanisha. Uh, sitting here at the same table indicates how closely we're already working together to deal with these issues, and we'll continue to do so. So my role today is to begin this update on the ongoing litigation around the federal attacks on our vehicle sta emission standards and some of their implications for transportation. Because this is early stages, this will be a high-level briefing. Um, the very high level is it's illegal, and we're doing our best to handle it. So um, where do we start? The Trump administration has continued to move forward in two phases um, to finalize its rollback of vehicle emission standards and to attack our own. The first of those phases um, was finalized a few weeks back, um, which, as a proposed, which is, revokes California's waiver for its GHG and ZEV programs and determines those programs to be preempted by the federal fuel economy statute. The second um, phase of that rollback, which is not yet final, proposes to flatline federal greenhouse gas emission standards for cars and pickup trucks at 2020 levels through model year 2026 although it considered a range of slightly less extreme rollbacks. That second proposal was opposed um, by 17 auto companies, the UAW, Consumer Reports, and most of the states, and has not yet been finalized, but we expect to see it finalized sometime later this year. CARB submitted extensive comments on both of these actions, which we believe to be illegal and contrary to the factual record. Um, we will proceed and are already proceeding with litigation on these attacks as appropriate. So we are already litigating to defend Californians. At the end of September, as I mentioned, um, the first phase of the rollback was finalized. The next day, uh, we filed suit in the Federal District Court for Washington, D.C. to challenge the rule issued by the U.S. Department of Transportation's National Highway Transportation Safety Administration, or NHTSA. That, again, was their role purporting to preempt our vehicle emission standards. We were joined at the time by 22 other states, including, um, and then plus California, Washington, D.C., and the cities of Los Angeles and New York. That was accurate as of yesterday. San Francisco, the city and county have joined that litigation as well. Um, we also have ongoing litigation regarding an earlier federal decision to scrap the Obama-era standards. 
and we will continue to file appropriate litigation, including in the near future, against US EPA's legally separate attempt to revoke California's waiver for its GHG and zero emission vehicle programs. CARB is fighting this hard because these rollbacks have very large negative consequences for all of us. The rollback would allow vehicle greenhouse gas emissions to increase by tens of millions of tons over time, as well as increasing emissions that form smog and soot at the very moment when we most need to keep cutting them. The result would be increased pollution burdens even as we need these deep pollution cuts to meet these federal ambient air quality standards, as Mr. Corey discussed a moment ago. Um, large parts of California have the worst air quality in the nation, and we need strong vehicle standards, including the greenhouse gas and zero emission vehicle standards, to help meet state implementation plan, or SIP is the term, federal air quality commitments. We risk increased asthma, heart disease, and other health threats to Californians, as well as harm to our efforts to address climate change. So this is both a public health issue and a climate issue. Importantly for this group, Dirtier cars mean that transportation projects that increase the use of cars will also be more polluting. This has near-term implications, as those impacts do need to be disclosed and addressed properly in transportation planning. It could also have long-term implications if the Trump administration actions are not reversed, as dirty cars make it hard for us to attain air quality standards in the long term, as well as our state climate goals. Recognizing this link between emission standards compliance and successful transportation planning, CARB, working with our partners, is taking a hard look at the recent federal actions and our own tools to address them here in California. CARB's MFAC, which stands for Emission Factor Model, which is used for conformity, assumes continued operation of our zero emission vehicle standard, which, as I've noted, the feds have purported to preempt. If that program remains preempted, we will need to consider ways to reflect the effects of that decision in conformity analysis. We also need to continue our joint work to help to keep cleaning up the air and reducing vehicle miles traveled. The federal government has thus far not stated any position at all on transportation conformity for California projects. It has not indicated that we need to revisit conformity, a process usually initiated by stating that we are in a conformity lapse or freeze. Instead, its rulemaking documents indicate that the federal administration expects states to address any relevant change circumstances themselves. This means that though we do face complex issues, we have some time and space to work out how to address them here in California, and that is what we are doing. So, even as litigation continues, we are addressing these change circumstances as best as we can, deliberately and quickly. The rollbacks have created real problems, to address them, there's a joint um, CARB, CALSTA, Caltrans working group already established to explore near and long-term impacts in conformity and on transportation planning. That working group will be reaching out to planning bodies throughout the state as needed, and I know some of those meetings are already happening. We are working to assess the emissions impact of the federal rule, develop an adjustment factor for conformity models that can be implemented quickly and then analyze the effects of that conformity challenge for each MPO and project. So we're gathering those facts and building that analysis. This analysis, in turn, will inform our options as we determine how to mitigate the impacts of the rule in a manner that protects public health and allows key transportation plans and projects to move forward with minimal disruption. Of course, in the medium to long term, California needs to continue to invest in a range of affordable housing and transportation options, further reduce VMT, and accelerate the transition to a zero emission future in order to improve air quality and to continue to support our communities. The federal rollback intensifies this need, which already existed, because it makes cars dirtier. Therefore, we need to continue and deepen our work. We need to collaborate, address the issues as or when they arise, deal with the near-term challenges, and continue to move forward together. We look forward to this joint work. Thank you. Darwin Mufasabi. Thank you, Craig, for that introduction to the issue. My name is Darwin Musavi. Uh, despite what my placard says, I actually work for the California uh, State Transportation Agency um, as the Deputy Secretary for Environmental Policy and, and Housing. Uh, so sorry for the confusion. I saw some looks um, analyzing my placard uh, from across the room. Um, I wanted to expand a little bit on, on Craig's remarks and talk a little bit about 
the coordination work that we're all doing between agencies. Uh, so first off, on behalf of CALSTA, I want to assure all of you, as was mentioned by CARB, that this issue is at the center of our attention. We're fully aware of um, and sensitive to the issue faced by many MPOs, RTPAs, and other transportation partners whose plans and projects face uncertainty due to the potential air emissions uh, modeling challenges posed by the final rule. Uh, while this is a complicated issue, we're mindful of the potential consequences on project delivery, as well as funding if transportation conformity requirements are not met, which is why we're taking actions to better understand the issue in order to address them in a way that minimizes negative impacts. Um, as was mentioned by CARB, we've already formed an internal state agency coordination group consisting of CALSTA, CARB, and Caltrans to do technical analysis and identify potential near-term options and solutions. Um, over the next several months, this technical coordination group will be working diligently to understand the impacts of the safe rule on transportation projects. And uh, the goal of this group is, is threefold. Um, first off, the group will coordinate work um, occurring across the three agencies to defend against the safe rule and understand its impacts to make sure all the agencies have up-to-date information. Uh, secondly, we'll coordinate, communicate, and outreach to affected stakeholders, including our regional transportation agencies and other key transportation partners, as well as this body and uh, the CTC in particular, uh, to uh, 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 outreach, um, sorry, on project and planning implications of the SAFE rule. This outreach will be led by CALSTA and CARB as part of the work group. Communication will be ongoing um, and has already begun. We uh, actually had a meeting with uh, SACOG last week and we'll be continuing those conversations and reaching out to our MPO partners um, uh, over the coming weeks. The third part of this coordination is once we better understand the impacts, this group will discuss policy responses to address imp impacts in a manner that mitigates the emissions impact of the rule while also allowing key projects to proceed. Again, we'll engage our transportation delivery partners through this process um, as it unfolds and uh, ensure that the solutions we're putting forward are ones that we all agree to. Uh, we're confident that we'll be able to address these issues together and identify a good path forward. Uh, to that end, um, I commit to you that we're in close communication and will continue to be in close communication with all of you over the coming months. And I will turn it over to Tanisha. Thank you. Thank you, Tanisha Taylor. You'll have to forgive me, I'm a little under the weather. So hopefully you can hear me and you can understand me. Um, thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Welcome to the new commissioners um, to talk about the safe vehicle rule and the transportation impacts. And we, as we've all articulated, we've all been working very closely together. We were even joking that Craig started with the words, I'll finish with the pictures, um, so that we, we cover the gamut of our learners throughout the room today. So a couple of things, just to go back to our May workshop and remind everyone of what we're talking about detail is this, that the safe rule affects approximately 93% of the state's population when we talk about criteria of pollutant emissions. And so we're not talking about something small here as Craig and, and Chair Nichols and Vice Chair Van Kenneinenberg have articulated as well. It revokes CARB's authority to implement the 7 GHG mandates as Craig's mentioned already, but it also threatens our ability to meet our goals. And we're not just talking small goals, we're talking very significant goals and how the state moves forward to protect our residents and um, both economically and health as well as air quality. Um, bad news, we've talked about this and again, I'm, I'm the visual one. Um, the final rule is here and it's effective November 26, 2019. Um, so, we have projects at risk, as you've heard, and I'll talk about why these projects are at risk as we kind of go through. But I want to remind everybody, because I continue to hear this, this notion that maybe there's a silver lining to this thing. There is no silver lining. Um, this includes transit projects. It includes our large-scale rail project. It includes our new corridors for light rail as well as heavy rail. So there, there is no silver lining. There is no, this may be better in some way. It's just not. Um, so we've heard California sues, but what does that mean? Um, when Craig talks about California and the state have sued, when we talk about the transportation agencies and how this 
this impacts us, um, there are a couple of things that, that the litigation means to us in particular. And so there's this question of injunctive relief and what does that mean? And so the state has requested permanent injunctive relief, which means that at the end of the court case when the court rules, um, that is when the impacts of transportation potentially stop depending on where you are on that scale of impacts. And in some cases there may be no impacts, in some cases there may be a lot of impacts, but the impacts will vary across the regions. And that's what we're working out through this working group. Um, but it's important to recognize that the rule will be implemented um, in the transportation sector and throughout the state as CARB uh, fights its legal battle. So what does this mean for transportation? And in the chart, you can see the green and yellow. The green represents metropolitan planning organizations. The yellow represents the regional transportation planning agencies. And again, to reiterate, uh, when we talk about uh, non-attainment areas in the state, there are 14 MPO regions and eight rural counties. So this is not an urban issue only. This is a rural issue in the state as well for transportation. It places local transportation projects at risk. And I'm not going to get into a lot of detail, but if you do go to the CalCog website, we do have a safe rule summary that highlights what transportation products will be at risk. Um, it also limits non-attainment areas' abilities to amend the Regional Transportation Plan and the Federal Transportation Improvement Program. And for those documents, the Regional Transportation Plan covers a span of 20 years. The Federal Transportation Improvement Program covers a span of four years. But that, that, that's effectively how we deliver the transportation system in the state of California. And those are crucial documents um, in that process. And so there's varying degrees. So these projects are, uh, these are projects that are, um, that, are, that the Clean Air Act is applicable to and transportation conformity is not exempt from. It limits non-attainment areas' abilities to adopt new regional transportation plans and federal transportation improvement programs. And that too is important because that's where we add new projects, that's where we meet the state's ambitious GHG reduction goals. Um, so it really does, again, hit all of our goals and really hamper and threaten our ability to meet those goals as we're moving forward. Um, the impacts will be different by region. Um, one of the reasons the impacts will be different by region, it really depends on where you are in project delivery. So there are individual project impacts, but it also depends on where you are in the delivery of your regional transportation plan. So each of the state's 18 MPOs delivers its regional transportation plan on a different schedule. Some are earlier, as early as February of next year. Some will deliver it in 2022. Um, as we work through and we analyze the potential impacts of the rule with CARB and CALSTA, those schedules will matter because the impacts will vary based on those schedules and the schedule of where you are in the project delivery process, whether you're studying your environmental impacts or you're acquiring right of way or developing um, for construction, that all has a different impact as to how the rule will be felt as you deliver your project. Um, We've heard from Mr. Corey that the Trump administration has um, threatened us with highway sanctions. Um, everything that Mr. Corey has said is true. The only thing that I will add to what Mr. Corey has said as CARB works through those things to allay some of the fear, it's a nice headline, it's a big bold word, sanctions are a horrible thing. Um, but the way highway sanctions work in the Clean Air Act is that the, that EPA has to publish uh, a notice in the Federal Register first. Um, once that notice is published in the Federal Register, highway sanctions don't take effect for 24 months. I have faith in CARB that they will move forward and get this process resolved before 24 months. And obviously, if we're coming closer to 24 months, we'll all report the status of where we are in the process moving forward. But I don't think we'll have to do that. So um, even though it's a big headline and he's threatening our money, uh, we have time to work through those issues and we have quite a bit of time. So let us work through those issues. Let us coordinate with CARB and we have faith that we'll get there. And if for some unforeseen reason um, we can't, we'll come back and we'll report to that and what that means. Um, so specific project questions, clearly today it's a very high level presentation, but I want to give some resources where the regions can go, where our local agencies can go. So I encourage you to contact your local MPOs, your county transportation commissions, your regional transportation planning agencies, all of those agencies um, that my members are used to coordinating with, as well as Caltrans on the project delivery side for our rural agencies. And so what's next? Um, we're going to continue to support the state's fight for clean air and public health. We're going to work collaboratively across state, regional, and local agencies to minimize negative impacts of the final rule, 
continue to track the status of the safe rule part two, as well as continue to reach out to US EPA and FHWA so that we continue to understand the impacts of the rule. FHWA, Federal Highway Administration has indicated there is no guidance currently. There is a question of how long it will take to have guidance so that they will know how to proceed. And so we'll be following that and providing updates as well. Additional resources, this is the website link that we provided um, here for our CalCOG policy tracker um, that gives you a little more detail on the types of transportation impacts. And with that, we'll be happy to take any questions. All right, now's the time to ask questions. I would start with, uh, if you want to ask a question, please put your nameplate on an angle so that I can recognize you. All right, I'll start with Chair Nichols and then I'll go over here and... Uh, oh, it might isn't a question, it's really a comment. I just want to thank uh, Tanisha and the MPOs for having helped us uh, communicate about what's going on and understand the potential impacts and make sure that we're working together closely because uh, you're absolutely right. It's a, nothing has actually happened, but the potential and the process are important. And so it's, it's one of those situations where you have to raise enough of a level of alarm so that people understand that we really are going to need to do something, but not get people panicked to, to thinking that they're about to lose their projects. And so I think you're doing a, a terrific job. I just want to thank you for that. Thank you. Uh, over here, forgive me. I, Senator Monning. Senator Thank Monning. you, yeah, Senator Bill Monning. Uh, I don't know if it's for the panel or council, but is there any timetable on the injunctive relief um, uh, that California is seeking with yes. other states? Uh, Senator, not at this time. We filed our complaint and our amended complaint over the last couple of weeks, so we'll go in early phase briefing. Typically, the D.C. District Court operates relatively expeditiously, but, you know, it'll be next year we'll hear. Thank you. Lucy Dunn. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, this is hot. Okay. Um, I love that we have some time and that we can rely on uh, Air Resources Board to be a strong leader in the litigation on this. In the meantime, we also know everything's connected in this state, housing and transportation both, and those sustainable community strategies that are out there under review. Can you talk a little bit about, are we just going to recognize we've got code red going on here, but we also have to continue our processes and expedite those sustainable community strategies, get them out so that you know we can kind of stay the course while the battle rages. Can you talk a little bit about your strategy there? Sure, and this is a, a really an area of developing strategy. Part of what we're doing is having exactly that conversation. So what's true just on timing is that the federal sort of preemption actions are effective at the end of November. So right now, nothing has legally formally changed. And people are making different choices during that sort of pre-effective date period. And then the task, obviously, is to understand, because something real has changed here in terms of increased emissions, how does one manage that? And there's both a near-term task, which is understanding the degree of change, and then a longer-term task, which is figuring out how to fit that properly into strategies. But in terms of particular strategies, I think that's an ongoing conversation, just as we need to understand exactly how um, this is all affected. When do you think you'll have that? So, if, because we need some. Oh, absolutely. We need some definitive we, we've talked here. about working over just the next couple of months to get to a first phase understanding. And and. I can add. So Tanisha Taylor with CalCog. Uh, one of the things that the regions are doing and have been working on is there's a question of can they accelerate their processes if they're really close to the finish line. Um, and some regions are looking at whether they can accelerate their process to gain federal approval before November 26, which would allow them to continue through. Some regions are not at that point. And so what some regions have done to try to mitigate some of the impacts is they have actually uh, taken a good look at their regional transportation plan to see which projects aren't consistent. Maybe the schedule has been delayed a little bit 
that the scope and stuff is still the same, um, but need to, to amend the regional transportation plans. And so over the last couple of months, the regions have been amending their regional transportation plans to mitigate some of these transportation impacts. For some of the individual project impacts, they are unknown. And so we're going to continue to work through those. For some of the regional transportation plans, they're too far out to accelerate quickly enough. And so that, those are the schedules that we're identifying with CARB and CALSA to help as CARB is developing uh, the technical tools to use to continue to move forward and so that we can prioritize how we deal with each region's needs so that we're, we're ensuring we're minimizing to the extent feasible uh, those impacts that we might feel. Thank you, Tanisha. Yep. So I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman, one more. So um, I'm presuming, of course, that we go back to uh, normal processes if we can get that preliminary injunction. Okay. And uh, and then and everyone is back on a, the the regular playing field, and we can get these things going. Yeah, just for is a, a permanent injunction uh, formally, uh, but but yes, uh, if we win this case, we're back where we should be. Right, got it. And Thanks. in the meantime, I, I just want to say we want to be fast and we want to be right. So we're trying to hit both of those goals. Uh, board member Mitchell. Thank you. Thank you for your reports. I assume this is on. I need to put it, put it up a little closer. A um, couple of questions. Uh, one uh, thing that happened in the letter that uh, Andrew Wheeler uh, sent to our chair, Mary Nichols, was a request that we withdraw all of our submittals by today, October 10, and resubmit. So my question is, are we doing anything? What are we doing about that? Uh, a ludicrous uh, request. So what is, that, what is actually going on there, as Mr. Corey discussed, um, is a long-running process that we we're already collaborating with EPA on over the last couple of years. I think at some point there were several hundred SIPs they hadn't processed. It's now down to around 130. Um, of those, staff have reviewed them all and are working it through. But it's a fact-specific process. So there's not really a reason to withdraw SIPs that EPA has not identified anything wrong with. But there is a need, and I think we said this in our response letter, that we are going to go right in and meet with them and talk through if there's anything they can identify that actually should be withdrawn. Happy to look at that. But so far, they, they just haven't. OK. Uh, the other thing that um, is a bit complicated is the um, timing and processing of the litigation. Yes. And as it relates to ambient air quality deadlines, ozone deadlines for the various regions, and how uh, that can be worked through. The, the permanent injunction would play into that if we get a permanent injunction. But um, obviously, we want to avoid sanctions and the federal government taking over our implementation plans. But have, have we talked about or thought about how we get those two, two things coordinated? Um, yes. So one thing I should say that um, may be non obvious is these two issues are pretty distinct. The, the SIP threat letter essentially involves US EPA pressuring us to do their homework. So all those roles are already in effect and are doing their job to reduce air quality. It's just have they been reviewed by US EPA. The second issue, which is the issue you're raising, is the fact that the attack on our emission standards obviously weakens our ability to comply with federal ambient air quality standards. And so there's a real irony and US EPA on a Thursday telling us that we lacked authority to implement critical standards. And then on the next, I think it was Tuesday, saying that we had to do a better job implementing federal ambient air quality standards, which. So yes, it's a problem. Um, inherently, if we can't get those tons through the efficient, effective standards we now have, we have to look <laughs> at other measures to get them. And one of the things that I said in my talk, which is critical, is that this is it's not a new challenge that thinking about how transportation and air go together to help reduce emissions and protect the public and deliver everything else we need to deliver is an urgent challenge. And one of the things that this federal action does is intensify the need to address that challenge. So yes, we see the connections. They are thorny. And we are dealing with the sort of bitter irony that we are trying to do our best while they try to take our tools. Uh, and do you expect the case to go to the Supreme Court? You know, it's unclear at this juncture. Obviously, it's an important case. There are many states involved. 
On the other hand, we have won aspects of this case before. The Supreme Court ruled in 2007 um, that these two programs were properly harmonized. We won in two different federal courts as to the preemption issue also in that time period. So the issues in some ways are stale and decided in our favor. And the facts are very much in our favor. So we'll see. We'll go through the district court. We'll be an appellate court. We'll see what the timing of all that is. It could happen, could not happen, and it will turn a bit on what the next administration decides to do. Thank you. Commissioner Butler. First, I, is this on? Yeah. First, I just want to thank the three of you. That was extremely helpful. Um, thank you. And, uh, you know, Darwin, as, as folks in the transportation world, I'm used to, to hearing um, how brilliant the agency staff is. Uh, but Tanisha and Craig, that was, that was great. Tanisha, my sister's name is Tanisha. So I'm just trying to not like look at you and think you're gonna tell me to clean my room. Um, but I, I, I appreciate, it's clean, don't worry. I appreciate, um, I appreciate the pictures. And uh, Craig, Craig and I went to law school together um, and we didn't interact as much in law school. You were always passionate about environmental work and I was always passionate about throwing parties. So it's good to, to interact now, but I think my question for for, for you, uh, Craig, specifically, is this is a lawsuit where 23 other states yeah. are, are involved. Um, and we're getting a lot of the news, obviously, um, as a large state. But what are some of the other states doing? And while I appreciate that um, you know, we're coordinating internally within the state, how are we working with other states? Are we really the leaders on this? Are there, you know, can, you, can you talk a little bit more about what more of the, the national landscape is and how we're fitting into that? Sure. So. When the Trump administration came into office, we formed what's functionally an ongoing collaboration with many other state air agencies and with other states' attorneys general. And that's continued. In this case, um, our attorney general, working really closely with CARB, the governor's office, all our partners, is leading all this litigation. Um, we are in more than weekly contact with all the other AGs and all the other agencies working this through on every level. Um, so that's been well coordinated and we're driving that charge. Um, that's not just a legal response though. On the policy response, this past summer, I think it was 24 states signed on to the nation's clean car promise, which was focused on taking policy actions across the gamut of legal and policy space to deal with these issues, recognizing that the threat on new vehicle standards, although acute, isn't the only thing folks can be doing. So just in the past couple weeks, for instance, both New Mexico and Minnesota indicated that if this litigation resolves favor favorably, they would be joining California's standards, which is great news. And many other states have begun issuing executive orders, taking action, looking at ways, do they join our standards, do they take other actions, and that's an ongoing collaboration. So there's a lot of joint work there that I think is really positive. Um, that um, I think will continue and intensify. All right, um, one last question. Uh, Darwin, you mentioned that there's, uh, the, the department and, and Caltrans and uh, CARB are working together. Who's, who's the point person on that? Are you the point person that pulls that all together? Yes, I'm, I'm working uh, closely with uh, Jen Gress of the California Resources Board and then Marlon Flournoy of uh, Caltrans. The three of us are the leads for each of the three okay. agencies. But you get the glory when, when it's all done, said and done, right? <laughs> we'll we'll um, uh, take the glory together. Okay. All right. all but right. but uh, CalSTA is going to be the lead in terms of uh, reaching out to MPOs and coordinating the meetings okay, so and, if, and whatnot. If, so you would be the point person yep. if staff needs to coordinate anything, you're the guy. Yep, come to That's me. That's what I like to hear. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you very much for your panel. I'll now uh, dismiss you and call on our next panel to come forward. Our next panel is uh, going to be on housing and transportation linkages and is also going to review the governor's recent executive order. Uh, Kate Gordon is the from the Governor's Office of Planning and Research. Kate, if you'll raise your hand, it's kind of obvious that you're going to. And then Zach, who also uh, who already uh, we we saw, is also here. And I'm just going to. Uh, an, uh, Chair Nichols has to uh, uh, take a phone call. It doesn't mean that she's unhappy or anything. She just has to take a phone call and, and has to come back. So I'm, I'm she's not she's Chair not Nichols. ignoring you. <laughs>
All right. Uh, have you guys decided who's going to? Uh, um, yeah, I think I'll, I'll okay. Go Director first. If that's right. This is on. I think. Um, thank you so much for inviting me to speak, and um, congratulations and welcome to the two new commissioners. It's great to see you here um, and to see many, many folks that we've talked to before. Um, my name is Kate Gordon. I am the director of the Governor's Office of Planning and Research, which is, as you know, the sort of long-range planning think tank within the Governor's Office. I'm also the Governor's Senior Advisor on Climate Change. In both of those roles have been very centrally involved with the development of the executive order and now with the implementation of the executive order. So very uh, honored to have been invited to come and speak with you about that today. I'm going to give an overview of what's in the executive order, a little bit of background, just a little, on why um, the, the governor felt this was such an important moment and an important time to put this forward, a little bit on next steps, but I really want to leave room for questions because I'm sure there, there will be many. Uh, one question for you, uh, Vice Chair, is whether you want us to do questions uh, at the end of both presentations? We're gonna do the questions at the end of both presentations. Thank you so much. So, um, I think you heard this morning from Chair Nichols about the, uh, a little bit about the executive order, and I know yesterday Secretary Tim, uh, Kim talked about, excuse me, Secretary Kim talked a little bit about the executive order. Uh, one of the things Secretary Kim said yesterday that I just want to emphasize even before I start is that the executive order in no way supersedes state law. It, in fact, uh, really is intended to build on state law and to help us implement state law in a variety of areas in a more coherent and uh, integrated way. So it's very, very important just at the outset to say um, this executive order does not supersede state law, nor could it um, legally. So um, so wanted to put that out first. So the, the executive order, um, I know many of you are very focused on that second point, but really is, a, is an important kind of overview uh, integrated order that makes, does a couple of things. And let me talk a little bit about the goals and then a little bit about what's in it. Um, and again, this executive order was signed just as a reminder just before, uh, it was about three, three weeks ago, uh, just before the governor went to New York for Climate Week. It was in development, the separate pieces, for quite a long time before that through several interagency processes, um, and this sort of was the culmination of those. What the overall goal of the order is, is really to um, acknowledge uh, key Acknowledge, as, as sort of Chair Nichols said, that we need to move from ambition to action when it comes to our state's uh, not only climate goals, but the statutes and laws that govern what we have to do as a state to address climate change. Um, we, uh, one of the things I did when I first started in this role was to look at all of the existing goals that we have as a state um, in statute on climate change and look at where our gaps are. And one of the things the executive order is really intended to do is to acknowledge and start to address some of those important gaps, particularly around transportation, but also in other areas. The goal of the order is also to take a more integrated approach to climate. We've done a lot in this state that's been incredibly proactive and we've been leaders on climate change in various areas, um, a lot on technology, a lot on renewable energy and efficiency. Um, vehicle technology obviously has been a big area. We haven't always integrated all of those pieces and so you'll hear from both of us the need to integrate particularly the housing and transportation pieces and start to try to tackle this very difficult issue of our land use and how it impacts our climate, um, both in terms of mitigating climate emissions and in terms of how we deal with the risks from physical climate change is a big goal of the order. The order is also intended to try to start mainstreaming how we think about climate change, again, both physical impacts and mitigating climate um, emissions, how we start to mainstream that into the planning and financing and decision making at the state level, particularly when we're making multi-decadal investments and we're using taxpayer funds to do that. So how do we start thinking proactively and in a more integrated way about how we make those investments and what the climate impacts have to do with those investments? And finally, the order acknowledges that we're in a time of transition. This is a new moment frankly, both in terms of climate impacts. I mean, I think we, we see that every day. We're in the middle of another set of blackouts right now um, because of climate impacts and the economic impacts of those on our state. But to acknowledge the time of transition, both in terms of physical impacts, also in terms of our need to dramatically scale up 
uh, our actions on mitigation if we're going to meet our goals that are, again, in statute, and also, um, a, as you all know, a time of transition in technology in the transportation sector. So there are four issues. I, I say all that to say that, that, that each piece of the order uh, relates to each other piece. Um, there are four big pieces of the order. The first uh, asks um, for the state, the Department of Finance, and my office, Office of Planning and Research, to work with the CalPERS and CalSTRS and Cal Retirement Systems to leverage our investment portfolio of about $7 billion um, to actually advance our climate goals. And again, that's to look at both uh, impacts from physical climate um, uh, change and also to look at uh, where the opportunities are, frankly, as the world shifts toward uh, a more carbon neutral and carbon free economy. The second big area is to leverage the state's transportation spending to reverse the trend of increased fuel consumption and reduce GHGs associated with the transportation sector. This piece goes directly at something that was raised in, in CARB's uh, SB 150 report last year, making the point about land use being an important and key contributor to our transportation emissions, that just switching out all of those vehicles for electric vehicles will not actually get us to a solution on that problem. We could do 10 times the number of EVs and still need 25% reduction in our VMT to meet our goals. The third section um, is about leveraging the states, working with the Department of General Services to leverage our owned and leased assets. Um, again, to minimize our carbon footprint, acknowledge physical climate risk, and look at carbon mitigation. I would put sort of the investment and the asset pieces a little bit together, um, and I'll talk a bit more about that. And then finally, a piece that really directs CARB to, frankly, scale up and figure out new ways to get to that um, EV goal, because we, we do, in fact, need to address the, the engine and, and vehicle side of this. I'm going to talk for just a couple minutes about, you already know all this because we've done other presentations, but the why here. Um, uh, as you know uh, and have seen, and this is from the ARB report last year, uh, one of the areas in which we are not meeting our goals and in fact are going up in emissions continues to be our VMT per capita. Uh, that is in, in large part related to our housing affordability crisis and people moving further and further away from their jobs. And that's something Zach will talk about, I'm sure. But this is where housing and transportation really come together in the state um, when, it, when it comes to climate. And I think this is animated. Ooh, there we go. Animations. This is all Chris Ganson from my office. There we go. Oops. Animations. Um, so you can see we are not on track to meet our um, statutorily required uh, targets in this space. Um, uh, we, uh, we need to take some pretty significant action and think creatively and strategically about these land use decisions to make our targets. And I just want to emphasize that this isn't just about sort of a esoteric set of targets that are up there about climate change. This is about the reality of what it is to be on the roads in California today. And we all experience this reality. I spend a lot of my time um, in, in the work I do for the governor in inland California, have spent an enormous amount of time in the last six weeks uh, in the Central Valley Inland Empire up in the North State. This is the first thing that's raised in every single part of the state at this point. How far people are driving to get to their jobs, how long their commutes are, how difficult their commutes are, and the need for alternatives and options to reduce that. There's an air quality impact to this, as we've talked about. There is a quality of life impact to this. People aren't seeing their kids. People aren't getting exercise. There are huge impacts that go beyond this, um, the sort of numbers on carbon emissions. And I just wanted to raise that. The second thing I wanted to raise, and this is from a Caltrans report, I think you've seen some of the vulnerability studies Caltrans has done. Uh, one of the things we're trying to do in the executive order um, across the board is to think not just about carbon mitigation and reducing emissions, but to think about reducing impacts from physical climate risk. Caltrans has seen enormous um, impacts from, here is a picture from that report from, or from a, from a news story about that report from Bakersfield, uh, impacts from mudslides, impacts from sea level rise, road, um, road failures, impacts last year, snow removal budget went over, I mean, impacts from climate change, um, impacts from extreme heat on, on concrete and, and cement. And these are things that need to be taken into account as we're thinking uh, uh, ahead about these investments. One of the big reasons we need to do that is because everybody else is doing it. The people from whom we borrow money are doing it. The people who insure us are doing it. If there's one thing that has been consistent in my time in the state, it's been the sheer number of people from bond rater issuer, um, the bond rater and issuer communities, from the investment community, from the pension community, endowments, insurers, com reinsurers coming in and saying, we are now, and BlackRock is a great example, we are evaluating our assets 
individually for climate risk and for climate mitigation. We are starting to evaluate our portfolios based on this. We are starting to look at uh, bond ratings based on this. We're starting to lend at different rates based on this. This is something that the market is doing and we as a state in order to shepherd taxpayer dollars need to do as well. So I'll just, uh, I'll, I'll just say a couple last words, which is to say that the executive order is really new. Um, again, what it does is try to take into account a, a huge amount of work that had been done in the past on what do our impacts look like. We have a lot of work that's been done through CalADAPT and other systems on what the state is going to face in terms of physical impact. Huge amount of goals and, um, and, uh, and particularly work at CARB on how do we reduce our carbon footprint and, and get to mitigation. Getting to those strategies um, is where the, as, as Chair Nichols said, is where the, where the executive order is centered. We did, um, the governor did just sign it, and so we're now in a process of figuring out the implementation strategy and putting timelines on each of those pieces. I just wanted to say a few last words. Again, the state goals and values here are very clear. We have very strong legal requirements, both on transportation infrastructure and on climate change. Our goals and our values are clear in statute, but these will play out differently in different parts of the state. We need to have a regional conversation, a stakeholder conversation about how this is going to work in operation. Uh, we need to be, we're starting the process now across CalSTA, across DGS, across the pension funds to have that conversation. We're including a lot of outside folks. We're doing a lot of regional discussions. Um, and at the end of the day, implementation will, of course, respect our current statutes and legal boundaries, and it will not affect already committed funds, which is something I know Secretary Kim talked about yesterday, but I think that's a really, really important piece as we move forward here. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm sure there'll be questions later. Thank you. Um, Zach? Well, thank you. Um, Zach Olmstead. I am, as was said, the Deputy Director for Housing Policy at HCD. I'm going to start with a little bit of just baseline understanding of what is required uh, from the state, mostly to local governments from a housing perspective, before I get into more specifics around what we've been doing around housing and transportation linkages. Um, the first is housing element law. So it is the um, one of seven mandatory elements in every local jurisdiction's general plan and is the only one that requires state approval. Um, each and every county has to prepare a housing element, uh, has to have, have consistency with other aspects of the general plan. It's updated for the most part every eight years, some jurisdictions every five years. It does require significant public outreach. It is adopted by the local government. Uh, we do at HCD and the folks in my division certify each and every jurisdiction's housing element. And uh, it has very important components of um, having to identify what sites are available for development based on what uh, we get, which I'll get into a little bit later, what is the housing need in that community. And uh, increasingly, compliance with housing element law, as well as the reports that are required on an annual basis up to us and how uh, jurisdictions are doing about meeting their housing need are beginning to be required, especially for many of our housing-related programs. And we'll get into a little about the housing and transportation as well for that. So this is a little bit of a busy slide if you have it in front of you, um, but it gives a little bit of a picture of the many things that go into that analysis that we do that local jurisdictions uh, have to engage in. Essentially, um, the jurisdiction has to identify their housing needs, including those for many vulnerable populations, identify a site's inventory in order to meet uh, developable sites that can accommodate new housing, um, talk about their programs by which they will get there, talk about their constraints potentially to get there, and um, as well as engage significant public participation in that process. So when um, we, we engage in a really iterative process back and forth with local governments in they typically adopt a draft, we give them feedback on that draft, and then um, they uh, adopt a formal element. All throughout that process, there's public comment we take into uh, consideration certainly any, any public comment that is given and then we want to see specific programs right that help them meet their individual local jurisdictions needs right as was mentioned we have a very diverse uh, state many different types of housing needs many different types of ways to get there right so we look at specific programs we'll see at the bottom there in terms of how they're going to get there how they're going to accommodate um, for example a specific ordinance that may be implementing how they address I'll just use it because it's fresh in the mind, an accessory dwelling unit policy, for example, right? How are they going to implement that in order to, um, you know, help bolster their housing stock and meet their housing needs? So, I'm just going to do this. 
So um, it used to be no one really paid much attention to this concept of what's called RENA, the Regional Housing Need Allocation, but you may have seen a little bit about it in the news uh, lately. Uh, and this is an assessment that we do leading up to that housing element process before each planning period, which is an assessment uh, of how many new housing units will be needed in each region to accommodate projected household growth. So, and it also is segmented by income levels. I should have mentioned the housing element, it's, it's extremely crucial. They have to identify in their zoning or planned zoning how to accommodate um, housing at all income levels, so including uh, affordable affordability. And so each local jurisdiction is assigned a share of that regional housing need. We provide the larger need to the region, which is then at the Council of Government level um, attributed down to each and every locality. And then it leads to that housing element, that accommodated need, and we review each local, locality's housing element to certify that it accommodates the share that has been given. These are some of the statutory objectives of the regional housing need allocation um, in terms of increasing housing supply, mix of housing types, re reaching affordability, infill development, et cetera. Um, it's very important that uh, recent changes in the law have really um, focused on uh, jobs, the jobs housing balance and relationship and um, as well as trying to create more equity within that, that process. And obviously balance of disproportionate household income distributions. Um, I think this is helpful for us to sometimes say, um, uh, the RENA is a planning requirement and a housing goal. Uh, it is the projection of housing need. Obviously we cannot build until, until, until we, we cannot build the housing we need unless it's appropriately zoned for, right? Good planning and good, and good zoning leads to the types of housing that we, I think, all want to see in our shared organizations in terms of proximity to jobs, access to resources and transit, those sorts of things. If you don't have adequate zoning, it's very difficult to get there. It takes longer to get things done. Um, but it is not a prediction of building permitting. It is not a quota. Um, it's not even a prescription, but it does require that adequate planning so you can show that when the demand is there, um, and certainly it is there in quite a few of our jurisdictions throughout the state, um, that there's appropriate zoning in order to meet there and to accelerate that process. And this is a, uh, a little bit of a, a pictorial about all the various roles of various organizations in this process. Um, I don't think I'll, I need to spell them out or read them through in person, but there is, you know, quite a bit of, of layered involvement, right? We have the state legislature that sets those laws and goals. We certainly are uh, at HCD are determining that regional housing needs and actually reviewing and approving housing elements. The councils of governments are very critical in not only providing supports to local jurisdictions, but helping they're involved in that arena process and helping provide resources and tools to get there. Uh, the local governments themselves, of course, have to identify their specific needs and do that planning. And of course, stakeholders uh, provide not only comments, but you know, I think in many cases help strengthen the housing plans or hold um, hold local governments' feet to the fire uh, as well as uh, as we do. But um, it's certainly at the local level and helping to meet those goals. A little bit um, on just what we, the things that we look at as I begin to talk about the housing and transportation linkage work that we've been doing with our partner agencies. You know, I think we think it's important, often in our housing world, we talk about the housing affordability and the cost of that. But what we like to do in, in our statewide housing assessment begin to report is, hey, it's a shared cost burden between housing and transportation. And you look at, I'm sorry if that's not very large, but you know, you look at that shared cost burden, uh, the blue is the housing cost, the green is the transportation cost. And uh, anytime you get over 50% in any of that, that's really critical. And you can see uh, a snapshot of, of what the burden is in many of our counties. Uh, people are paying, are paying significant uh, percentages of their household income on shared housing and transportation costs. And not to mention, obviously, the, the other uh, byproducts of you know, heavy commute times and other types of things that, that can happen in a household. So what we have been doing over the past couple of years and certainly strengthened over this past year um, is there's a housing and transportation coordination work, coordination work group at the state level. You see this first slide is the actual steering committee um, that meets. Uh, the next slide is uh, the various departments that are part of our working group. Uh, so everyone here, um, a lot of folks here have been involved in that work. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what has happened over the past year. Uh, these were the work group roles um, that we set uh, for 2019. Um, and in fact, there was even a um, 
subgroup identified to work on linkages between housing and transportation programs. I'm going to focus a little bit of my comments on, on, on those pieces. But to really engage one another on you know, possible improvements in our various funding programs, how can we make sure they're lined up to meet our mutual goals? Um, identifying even down to the nitty gritty of what are the threshold requirements and scoring criteria so we can make sure housing programs have, you know, references to transportation, transportation programs with references to housing and vice versa, so we can not only make the connection for one another, but truthfully for our applicants, so they're actually focusing on those pieces when they put together applications for our programs. Um, and certainly, obviously, get more ver uh, you know, conversant in our various uh, languages and, and how we talk about things so we can more universally uh, communicate right, to all our stakeholders, many of which overlap um, as they pursue our programmatic funding. So, uh, and specifically, we have been working together, uh, the research kind of of that working group, of that uh, sub, uh, of that sub working group on linkages, uh, thought that the, the first two kind of areas were transit and inner city rail capital program and the solutions for congestion corridors program made the most sense for the initial kind of collaboration. So we've been working together in kind of strengthening the program requirements and scoring criteria and other sorts of things for those programs. In addition, we do kind of joint review of a number of our programs that overlap and link, right? So you see a list there. Um, you know, so that I think is very effective in having our staffs actually looking at those things. We're looking at it with different lenses, right, to um, flag certain things, to highlight certain things, to make sure what we're seeing in those applications adequately is representing, you know, a good project that creates housing near transportation, creates transportation that can be accessed for folks in their housing, et cetera. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about some recent developments uh, specific to um, what we are doing at HCD. The most recently enacted budget puts 250 million to our department and my uh, division within the department to provide for planning grants to local jurisdictions to um, help meet their housing goals and their planning goals, right? We are for the most part, entering a new planning cycle. We're assigning these regional needs, there's housing needs allocations. Um, and these grants provide, are split 125 million directly to each and every city and county can access grants. We're calling them early action planning grants to begin to work on those housing strategies, that planning for this next cycle, identify adequate zoning. Hopefully, as I'll get into in a second, work on what we consider kind of pro-housing policies. Um, and then the other half will go directly to councils of governments and kind of uh, more regional entities to help facilitate and bolster kind of what may be the specific and regional needs, right? To really hammer on the strategies that may be unique to each and every um, region and to help support those goals. So it all, the budget also tasked us at HCD with coming up with what is called a pro-housing designation for local governments. So the idea there is if local governments are uh, enacting policies, passing ordinances, um, working hard to uh, make themselves a more fertile ground for not only housing development, but the right kind of housing development, right? Um, or that we would consider to be good housing development according to the pro-housing policies. Um, that there would be some benefit in the, in the long term in terms of competitive, competitiveness for some of our programs. So um, it gives us a little bit of a horizon in terms of developing. We'll have to go through the regulatory process by which we outline how a city would be designated pro-housing. But um, given the infusion of that $250 million that we're going to make available, we wanted to accelerate and signal what those pro-housing policies are to jurisdictions. We've already been doing that a little bit in some of our programs to local jurisdictions. Um, we are in the process of already awarding a different planning grant program through um, the passage of Senate Bill 2 from a couple years ago as part of the housing package that provided grants to local governments, very similar types of grants, to promote housing development. So we have a good fertile ground uh, to, to build with um, on what those kind of pro-housing policies are in terms of you know, increased density in your transit, accelerating the processing of permitting, you know, doing specific plans that do the kind of environmental analysis up front for communities on all the parcels within that, that plan area. Um, you know, buy right zoning, once you kind of meet some of those, some of those, um, some of those criteria. And so we have a good fertile ground, but um, very soon we will be issuing for public comment what those initial kind of round of pro-housing policies or are for public feedback. Um, and the idea here is a, it's a menu of, um, 
of activities that we want to encourage communities to focus on with these planning grants, right? They're not required to, but we think, hey, these, this pro-housing designation is coming. It's not a punitive designation. It's something that, that, that will help you. And if you engage in these types of activities, um, which would be a much more uh, a pretty expensive menu of things, we will then articulate, obviously, over the next year or two how you get, how you get designated there. But if you begin the planning activities now, right? You have this, this is the time we have those resources to focus on good planning. Um, if you engage in those sorts of activities, now you're going to be better off as we as we move towards towards the future. So it's a little bit of our uh, anticipated deadline. Um, we're, we uh, are hoping that all of these resources will be out uh, by the beginning of the year. Um, and uh, all, in fact, all local governments need to at least apply for and be awarded by the end of this fiscal year, essentially. And then the, the regions have a little bit longer. Um, and we are obviously going to be doing a significant amount of outreach once we release that notice of funding availability to communities because we want to make sure each and every city and county takes advantage of these funds. Um, it's not often that we've had this level of infusion for planning. And um, while not the only reason, you know, um, one of the reasons we have probably not adequately met our housing needs is because we haven't invested as much in the planning um, at the community level that we could in terms of um, doing all the kind of local ordinances, local stakeholder engagement, um, zoning, et cetera, that you know leads to good planning and good housing outcomes. So, um, I will stop there because I know there might be a lot of questions for Kate and I. Thank you. I now ask for questions from uh, commissioners and board members. If you please raise your. So I'll start with um, Gioa. Uh, Sure. Board member Gil. Okay. Uh, this is John Joy. I am the um, Barrier Quality Management District Rep on the Air Resources Board. First, I wanted to say thank you for this really strong executive order. It's great. Um, so really two questions. Uh, first, you've got members of um, two state agencies here. I think there's an opportunity for um, our, ver our various uh, commissions to work together with regard to helping leverage the transportation investments to reduce greenhouse gas reductions and also, frankly, to uh, help achieve the state's housing goals. So give us your thoughts. I may have my own, but I'd like to hear your thoughts about how our two uh, agencies can work together to achieve um, both the housing production goal in terms of the investments and the greenhouse gas reduction goals. And then the second comment is I also wear a hat on the Contra Costa Board of Supervisors. So we're a land use agency. And frankly, I think local government, cities and counties are not doing the best job from land use policy pr perspectives to either reduce, I mean, some are doing better jobs than others, but both to, to for housing production and for greenhouse gas reduction. Um, so your thoughts about, um, I, I think, opportunities to link state transportation investments to, commu to communities that are actually putting in place land use policies to both increase housing production and reduce GHGs. I think that incentive actually can help um, get local jurisdictions to do the right thing. So one is how we work together, second sort of this, this uh, relationship with local government. You want me to start? Yeah, you can start yeah. <laughs> a, thank you so much for the question. Yeah. It's a, it's a, an easy one. No, I'm just kidding. It's a tricky, <laughs> tricky set of questions. But um, you know, in terms of the, the two, uh, board, the board and commission working together. I mean, one of the really valuable things is just being in the same room. To be honest, one of the things that we've really come to recognize, I think, in both the transportation sector and on working on climate more generally, is just how integrated these issues are. You can't really think about any of these things in a vacuum at this point. I mean, climate change is, I, I often say, sort of a macroeconomic trend like globalization and automation. It will affect every sector. It will affect every decision. It's a very big set of things that we need to grapple with. And so and transportation is one of those, one of the biggest, honestly. It's mm -hmm. not just 40% of the emissions, but it's also a major piece of our state investment portfolio and, um, and the decisions we make at a state about long-term infrastructure. So the fact of being here together is incredibly important and starting to think about both of those things a little less siloed. Climate isn't just about sort of environmental impact and counting emissions, although it is certainly about that. 
Uh, transportation isn't just about uh, kind of building and maintaining roads, although there's certainly about that. There are, are multiple ways to look at both of those things, and they have to be integrated. I think that's hard because we're used to working in silos. Our mm -hmm. budgets are often in silos. Our mm -hmm. decision-making processes are often in silos. There are uh, obviously statutory requirements on both sides of that, of that puzzle, but where are the places where we can work together to get to common goals? The state has a set of very clear goals, and we're all working under those goals. And so what are the places that we can, can do that? And one of them is probably the other piece you asked about, which is what kinds of incentives, and this is something Zach may be able to get to more, can, and we're talking about a lot um, in terms of housing. What incentives can we, you know, can we get to the local level? Many of you are from local jurisdictions and are much closer to this than we are um, at the state. What are you actually hearing about the barriers to some of these actions? What are you hearing about frustration? What are you hearing about what could be made easier? Could we do more to um, streamline funding requirements to make those more integrated and a little easier for people to access? Could we do more to provide incentives for um, you know, pro in like the pro housing designation for sort of integrated approaches on the ground. Um, I ch I'm lucky I get to chair the Strategic Growth Council, and that's one thing that the uh, affordable housing community development, uh, the community strategies, and the transformative climate communities programs try to do is to integrate this stuff on the ground. We've learned a lot from that. What can we do? take from that, from the learnings there on the ground and really kind of bring those up into state requirements if possible? Because I think there's also a disconnect a lot of times with those you, two you things. Know, and this may sound blunt, but yeah. I think having been on our board of supervisors yeah. for 21 years, I think in, in many jurisdictions there's a lack of political will mm -hmm. to approve the types of land use changes um, to increase density where it's appropriate mm -hmm. to increase density and where it makes sense to increase density. Um, and, yeah. and approve more housing. So um, sometimes what gets um, local officials more incentivized to, to do that is extra dollars yep. linked to good actions. Yep. Um, so I, I, I'm just... That's a great point. That, that you, yep. stole, you stole a little bit of what I was going to say, but yep. um, yeah, I mean, that is, this on? Uh, that is the thesis a little bit on the pro-housing designation, right? Increasingly, we are going to build into more yes. programs the... Um, essentially a bonus for if you're, if you're doing those right things. Uh, and if I may, I, you know, I, I think you hit the nail on the head. I think in terms of working together, we all need to drive home the message that density is not a bad word. And um, while... Right. Um, density in the right place, that's, that's the no, way that's to a, say that's it. Right? A, a, yeah. Absolutely right. But um, typically, right, it is over time the actions at local government that makes a 200 unit project on the same land footprint a 150 unit project to a 100 project to a 75 unit project, right? And so over time, that has added up significantly over the decades, right? The resistance at the community level to um, increased density or more people uh, near me, um, you know, ha has, proven, has proven problematic. And I think what we've done over the last couple of years certainly have, have I think, will begin to change the, the, t the conversation there. Uh, many aspects of our state legislation over the last couple of years have actually made it harder for that to happen by making certain types of development by right, meaning uh, non-discretionary and, uh, you know, if it conforms with the zoning, then you, then you build it. Um, uh, with certain, certain, I'm not saying it's, it absolves local involvement, but it, 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 it's a beginning to acknowledgement, right, of the delays that occur there. Um, the suite of bills signed yesterday on accessory dwelling units, for example, you know, some people are saying, oh, well, it's the end of single family zoning in, in, in California. I mean, it's maybe not that drastic, but it is significant, right? So when you talk about the specific needs of communities and on the same land footprint, right, uh, have, allowing people to put additional um, living space on their property so they can age in place, so they can maybe rent it out for in the community, so they can have their children who maybe not be able to afford yet anywhere else. So I mean, I think there are a lot number of things that maybe are less scary from a, from a density perspective, but that uh, when combined will be um, helpful and maybe more hopefully received with all of our collaboration at the community level. And, and just finally, I mean, you, I know you didn't get into too much detail on how we could work together. You said, you know, being in the same room is a start. But what I find is that we can be at these meetings and talk about things and have some general agreement, but when we leave these meetings, that sometimes um, the cooperation may not be as robust. So um, it, it seems that in having some type of organized work group with the staffs or some direction to do that, because um, you know, both our agencies have different cultures 
Um, and um, as you say, this is really, we need an integrated approach. So maybe more incentive to, to really come back with some specific deliverables about what we can do together other than just being here a few times a year in the same room. Uh, I, and I think this, this, this slide and Zach talking about the housing yeah. transportation work group is a really important step toward that at the Sacramento level. I would also for just, GHGs for too. GH for G, for housing and transportation right. and GHGs the whole overlay. I would also say though that again on the regional point, uh, we've been doing a fair amount of work in my office talking to the Caltrans district directors, for instance, about many of these overlapping policies. And there are there are conversations that should also be happening at the regional level among people who are working at that level because I think that's a sometimes the Sacramento piece doesn't filter down or filters down not all that effectively, and there can be, um, I think, a lot more there, too. So I'll leave it to you on structure, but I yeah. think that would be helpful. Thank you. Uh, board Member Balms. Thank you. I, go, I wanted to thank uh, Kate and Zach for uh, really good presentations, and I'm just going to piggyback on what uh, Supervisor Joya said, but maybe through a different lens. Um, I was glad to see that uh, Zach mentioned uh, equity a bit, but I think we need to emphasize that a lot more because the folks that are having to drive the longest to get to their jobs, I'm not telling, I'm not saying anything that we all don't know, but it needs to be hammered home. The people that are driving the longest are the people that have low wage jobs in inner cities uh, and they have to to even get close to something affordable, they have to be way out. John and I actually saw that. We drove from uh, the East Bay and the traffic was backed up all the way to the Altamont Pass. Um, and so, and they're also probably driving older vehicles that are less clean. So they're, and I think in part, good intention sustainable community strategies have contributed to this because when Dense, more dense housing is built in inner cities. It's often, it's actually gentrifying in neighborhoods and pushing people out. Um, we have to be very careful. I mean, density in the right places and density that's affordable. And, you know, I don't have any magic answer to this, but this is a huge problem that kind of gets buried, I think, a little too much. There's a huge social equity um, an environmental justice issue here. Yeah, I mean, while I didn't, I wasn't able to show the whole menu of things that will be a part of our pro housing designation, anti-displacement <laughs> strategies that are at the local level are a key part of that in that menu. So there's a whole kind of category focusing on policies that, that, um, that, that assist with that. And of course, that can be a number of different things, right? So when that new housing is built, requiring levels of affordability, certainly some of our programs, affordable housing, sustainable communities program, right? We're trying to increase the stock of affordable housing within within jurisdictions. I think an area of focus that um, we certainly focus a lot on at the department, but that hasn't gotten as much um, attention at the state level, but I think will is preservation of existing, not only existing housing, but existing affordable housing, right? We, we, we typically put covenants of affordability on, on housing, and then when those expire, they just become market rate, and we don't do enough to, to handle that. So, you know, there's a number of, of, of ways we can approach that, and certainly our pro-housing policies are seeking to not only be about zoning for production, but about the policies at a local level that deal with those equity concerns, because we have a mandate, and typically our focus typically is dealing with the neediest and um, most low-income California's housing needs. Absolutely. And just very briefly, I know there's a lot of questions to say that um, one of the important things about this sort of housing transportation, in some ways that's not the full story. One of the things the governor's very focused on is the connection between housing transportation and jobs, and not just jobs, but what's in the executive order, and he's made very a strong pitch for also in the budget is high road jobs. So that's a shorthand for family supporting, career ladders, jobs that actually allow somebody to not have three or four jobs in order to live and kind of meet some of those costs that Zach put up there. So we need to think about jobs near housing and transportation, not just people still going two hours, but maybe it's in a slightly better mode, right? Um, and, and so those all sort of are, are very integrated into, into the high level on the executive order and I think really critical, um, certainly to the governor and the administration. Okay, we're gonna move to another question. I just wanna point a clarification for two things that came up. Um, when uh, the guidelines for all the different uh, discretionary programs are developed at the, at the uh, commission, 
currently staffs are are working together from CARB, HCD, and um, and the CTC. So we are working together on on making sure we develop those guidelines in coordination. I'm going to go to Commissioner Norton, uh, probably cursing the cameraman who has to pan back over. But <laughs> we'll do a couple on this side, and then we'll come back. So. Well, thank you very much. I'm I'm so excited about the executive order and when Secretary Kim yesterday was talking about it as well um, because really this is such a great expression of the governor's vision and I think your point about going from ambition to action and with policy alignment is very very exciting. Um, what I wanted to know is how we um, support you from the private sector with the, the opportunity to align this with economic growth. And I think that's all underlying every part of this vision, but I think, and, and plan, but how can we bring the private sector in that are so excited about this as not just housing opportunity, but when you talk about high road jobs, especially preventing the brain drain of all of our students that are graduating from world-class institutions in California and can't afford to live in the state. It just seems to me like there's an opportunity to align this as well with the economy and how can we go out around the state to talk about what this means in terms of a new economic moment and the economic resiliency you're building in. And then I wanted to ask a little bit about in the RENA numbers uh, about how areas like the SCAG region with some new arena numbers are going to have some opportunities for alignment of benefits for adding new goals and what that's going to mean for the opportunities to have new transportation, new housing, new job funds to, to support the new housing opportunity numbers as presented in the new arena numbers. Thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Norton. Great, great questions, um, big questions. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, you know, I'll, I'll, I can obviously say more um, and love to connect with you on this, but in terms of the big vision, I think these things, I, I appreciate you saying they are very integrated, and there's a couple places where this sort of larger vision is playing out. I mean, I think the governor and the administration and the legislature understand that we are at a moment of transition in a number of ways. Mm -hmm. Cities are growing differently than they than they did. Um, it, the economy is changing in terms of the types of industries, the, the place-based nature of those industries. Mm -hmm. There is an overlay, not just from our own very ambitious climate goals and agenda, but the world. Yeah. is adopting climate goals and agendas that are changing markets throughout mm -hmm. the world and are changing pricing and changing uh, you know, availability of certain technologies. Mm -hmm. um, and we're seeing changes in the transportation sector that are sort of a revolution, right? right. Um, Dan Sperling's not here, but he, I'll quote him and say it's a revolution. Um, <laughs> And uh, all those things are leading to a different sort of way of planning. And, and so I think the, the administration is trying to think that through in a number of ways, some of which have very specific private sector engagement. The Future of Work Commission is a place that I would point to and get involved with. Um, mm -hmm where that conversation is playing out uh, at a pretty high level, both in the public and private sector. In the implementation of the executive order, particularly around the investment side, um, we are pulling together a number of sort of more informal advisors from the investment and bond communities because they are actually watching these impacts. And we're seeing our own bond ratings change as a result of some of these climate impacts, and we need to get ahead of that. So we're trying to pull in that perspective because that's ultimately the world in which we're planning. Mm -hmm. um, and I just want to say at the end of that, that I, what I just said sounds very threatening and scary, but actually there's all kinds of opportunities yeah. when it comes to transition. Transition opens up massive opportunities for planning, for technology, for jobs, for a new way of building and developing that are actually quite exciting. And so I think there is a moment to kind of think through that opportunity side as well. And what that means for California, for our industries, we're kind of world leaders on some of these transportation industry technologies. Um, and we, are, we can be world leaders on some of these planning technologies too. That's great. And so. I also want to thank you on the ADU side. My kids can't <laughs> wait to move me into the garage. <laughs> and um, so this is, this is a, a very exciting moment because I do think it's about family stability yeah. as well as keeping neighborhoods growing. In My kids are teenagers, so they want to move into the garage. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, real quick, I'll try to be, I'll try to be succinct. Um, I think on the first piece, uh, one thing that whenever I am able to, in my capacities, whenever we are making investments around infrastructure or that lead to significant job growth, 
Um, I often, I think historically, we've often seen housing as part of the phase two of that. Oh, we're going to bring all these folks in and then we'll build the housing. Well, I've been saying quite a bit, you have to have that be part of your phase one. You can't be all of a sudden saying we're going to create all these jobs in this area and then do nothing about your housing needs or else all you're doing is exacerbating our, trans our bad transportation patterns, right? right. And so um, I think that's the important thing that I would love people to carry forward on this is housing needs to be an integrated part of that phase one when we're doing those investments that lead to significant job growth. The other piece, uh, which is a quite complicated question, but I think the important thing that we will look at, our role at the state, is looking at the region's methodology for how they look at their disbursement of housing need, and jobs needs to be a significant component of that, it needs to by state law, but uh, we'll be obviously looking significantly at that aspect of it when we see those methodologies. Thank you, very exciting. Commissioner Dunn. Yes, thank you. Thank you both for your presentations, thank you very much. Um, Zach. <laughs> If you could, what I love about our governor is he's given us moonshot goals, right? Mm -hmm. We've got 3.5 million homes we've got to figure out how to build. We've got major um, electric vehicles, uh, zero emission vehicles we have to achieve. We have greenhouse gas reductions. And I'd love when CARB presents the first slide that they present, shows us where we are um, uh, uh, in the track, right? I would, I would ask that we always, in housing, remind folks what the baseline is. Mm -hmm. We need about 200,000 housing units a year just to meet right. current population and jobs growth. And in 2018, we built 114,000. Right. We haven't even started to address the 3.5, right. which is what about 500,000 a year, 400,000 a year that the governor wants us to address. We haven't even started on that. Um, 2019, good news, we're already at about 120,000 units, so we're making some progress, but not even at the overage. And it's all about supply in housing, supply, choices, and affordability. And so uh, I link arms with CARB and say, we're going to be right there together when we increase our housing supply, choices, and affordability. And then we can, as well, at the same time, reduce our greenhouse gas emissions, because we know it's going to be built in the right places, both edge development and building up in the right places within our cities. So I would ask you to always give us the beginning, sure. those benchmarks, so we know where we are today. And don't be afraid. We're not even, we haven't even touched the governor's goal yet. But the, the goal, the good news is at least we're ticking up in 2019. And so for all of the meetings and all of the policies, if we don't connect it to actually physical improvements and, and, and trajectory toward our goal, it's just talk, right? It's just talk. So um, that would be my challenge to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, absolutely. You've given us a uh, good thing to bring to when Please. we're official members uh, Please. beginning next year. Always start I, with and, the numbers. And those numbers that you referenced, uh, and apologies, you know, short time, um, yeah. short mandate in terms of what to talk about, you know, began when we did our statewide housing assessment a couple of years ago. And so we um, certainly are just like you, uh, tracking on those numbers. And so uh, happy to... If it works, you know, try to try to bring those certainly to our working group meetings. But if it makes sense to do It'd it, be at, great. These, at these meetings. And then the other thing, Kate, I just am so fascinated by your discussion on CalPERS investment in California. It's been one of those most interesting things for me as a lifelong learner to learn about CalPERS. Not it's just not connected to my day job, but most folks don't realize they're the second largest investment house in the nation, second only to the federal government. Yeah. And yet 90% of our government workers' money is invested outside the state of California in other states and other countries and other businesses that don't have our greenhouse gas reduction rules. S sort of leading me to think that we're not a good investment here. And, and don't get me wrong, I don't think we should mandate. I think we should get good returns on investments <clears throat> for our government workers' pensions so that they, we're, I mean, they're, they're struggling enough, right? But I love that you're talking about CalPERS, and I've actually even mentioned this to Fiona Ma as well. How can we make the state, with all our great goals, a better investment for our own workers that are here? And if you could look at that in your planning, yeah. when you said that, I went, oh, I am so with you, girlfriend, whatever I can do <laughs> to help you on that one. Um, because fantastic. I would love them to invest more so that we can really showcase 
we're not doing leakage to other states, right? We're not sending all these young people we're educating in California to other states. We're actually keeping our young people here and keeping our investment here because this is a great place, because our goals are uh, outstanding and the way our world should go. A any thoughts on that one? Just really briefly, I, I really appreciate the comment. And I, I think that one of the, the kind of good, exciting things about this work is that because California has set up this framework of really ambitious policy goals that have driven the market here in the state, frankly, for a lot of interesting technology, both in terms of carbon mitigation, but uh, so so uh, electric vehicles, renewable energy efficiency, but also increasingly in in, um, in resilience, we're starting to see, have really interesting technologies in converting methane and CO2 into alternative plastics, um, into car, uh, water recycling and reuse, like all these interesting things. We have a huge number of the world's patents actually on clean tech right. and resilient technologies. We have set a policy framework that gives the market a lot of consistency and 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 uh, certainty about where we're going um, and uh, by setting these moonshot goals. Um, and we're starting to put this framework around resiliency as well. So I, what we're actually seeing from the private sector is that we are a, we're getting increasingly to be a good investment because we've gotten ahead of a lot of right. these issues. Right. And I think one of the interesting places to watch, and it goes to some of the, the work we talked about on, on transportation infrastructure, is in this resilience space. One of the things Treasurer Ma has done a lot of work on is looking at the fact that, that bonds are actually being offered at lower rates to places that are investing proactively in resilience. Mm. In uh, the insurance industry, Industry is also a major investor, and they're doing a lot of investment there as well. If we're investing in resilient systems, it lowers the insurer's rate of um, fire risk, for instance. Yeah. So there's all kinds of connections being made there. I actually think we're going to see a trend toward those kinds of investments, and that's what we're looking at. And so I'm, my benchmark is get CalPERS to invest 12% yep. in California. <laughs> that's when a great point. When it moves point. from that 10%, yep. I'm, I'm kind of pushing like Zach. Yep. Just give me the tail of the tape. Yep. And so I can I can see that we're on the right track. That's a great point. Thank, Thank you so you. much for bringing Thank it up. Uh, Commissioner Burke, and then we'll come back over here. Uh, first, uh, Zach, in full disclosure, I'm also on the board of Century Housing. Uh, <laughs> but I am so delighted to see that 375 is going to be part of this whole approach and concept. Because uh, hard fought, yeah. uh, I was on SCAG board when the fight was going on, because no one wanted to accept the idea that transportation and housing had to be coordinated because they were so concerned who would get on some of those trains and buses and where they would go and end up. Uh, and also in terms of employment. Uh, so I really want to commend you for uh, using this coordinated approach of bringing housing, transportation together in terms of goals and achieving some of those long sought after goals. My question is um, where will housing credits be in this whole plan? When you say housing credits, what do you mean? Do you mean like credit? Where do you get credit for housing within uh, meeting the, your the arena use numbers? Of housing credits in terms of the financing. Tax like tax credits, affordable housing tax, tax credits, low income housing tax right. credits. So uh, um, obviously, is, so just for everyone's benefit, the low income housing tax credit is pretty much the foundation of each and every affordable housing development deal. We have significantly increased the state share within some of the recent budget actions. Um, HCD sits on the tax credit allocation committee in the treasurer's office. They're, they're run through the treasurer's office. Um, and so we, what we've been doing is trying to increase that resource, knowing that they are the foundation. The other thing that we've been doing is, um, gosh, apologies for getting the minutia, there are two types of credits, both 4% and 9% credits. 9% right. mm -hmm. uh, are more valuable and thus competitive. 4% uh, is usually paired to private activity bond debt and um, typically not competitive, although we're doing, we've been doing so much in a good way that we may actually hit our ceiling at some point soon. But what we have done from our programmatic perspective is we have really incentivized developers, especially doing affordable housing, to pursue 4% credits. Be um, and we've done that by increasing our loan limits on our programs um, because it can be, if you can access them quicker, and you can access them faster because uh, with state with the nine percent credits, there's two funding rounds per year, so you might be waiting to get your financing in place. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a public policy goal, right, to get the housing built faster and get it financed in a better way. And so we have come in 
with essentially higher loan limits per unit on some of our affordable programs. That's so one of the ways we've done that. And so we work really collaboratively with, with the treasurer's office that, that does the tax credits. We sit on that board, the California Housing Finance uh, agency sits on that on that committee uh, as voting members, and so um, so we are able to have that lens when those things come in about meeting our goals. And so the example I even gave around, uh, and this was more with the debt limit allocation committee, also at the treasurer's office, was actually funding a big transportation project in down, uh, in in the state. In uh, in what the presentation was like, oh yeah, and housing will come after the jobs come. Then we'll build the housing. So my public comments were, well, actually, that's not acceptable to me. Like, you're actually <laughs> exacerbating our climate yeah. challenges if that's what you're doing. Uh, you're exacerbating our housing challenges if that's what you're doing. So uh, our representation on those boards, I think, is helping, as is the governor's um, certainly attention to the issue, uh, and making sure that when we make those investments through tax credits or through, the, through that bond activity, that we're connected as best we, we can. We just see so little housing, low-income housing, sure. or moderate-income housing that is developed unless they have access right. to these credits. And we have increased it significantly. This year was a $500 million increase to the state credit, for example. And, um, and so we hope that that will be uh, something that we can continue to do. All right. Thank you. All right, uh, board member Mitchell. Thank you. I have just a couple issues. Uh, one is that uh, all over the state and uh, even <laughs> other parts of the nation, we're seeing uh, disastrous homelessness. And um, this probably doesn't really fall right into your, the bailiwick of HCD, but um, I, it does fall into the laps of local government. And one of the things that I think HCD might be looking at is that um, what kind of housing is needed for homeless people, and we know that a substantial percentages of them are either addicted or mentally ill. And are we looking at a types of housing that would serve those interests? And, and that could be in the technical help that you give to local government when we consider um, new housing units. Yeah, so we uh, actually have a number of programs that we uh, target towards homelessness at the state level. Uh, the No Place Like Home program passed uh, by voters uh, just a year ago um, is a couple billion dollars over time. So we've been putting out $400 million installments down to counties and developers to build permanent supportive housing for people who are both homeless and have experienced mental illness. We have um, a supportive housing component within our multifamily housing program. We have a specific program also approved by voters several years ago that deals with homeless veterans. Um, and so uh, all told, on an annual basis, we're probably putting out over a billion, maybe close to a billion dollars around uh, actual production of new housing, permanent supportive housing. So that's affordable housing, just like you and I, you have a lease, but you're building in the services within it. Um, and then on the actual engagement at the local government level, um, they, each and every local government is required to cite not only for that affordability and serving all the special needs populations, including those people who are homeless, uh, but they also have to cite for emergency shelters. So that's not uh, permanent housing, but they are required by state law to cite for emergency shelters. And that is often, uh, or it has been for many communities, a sticking point in getting to compliance in their d lack of desire to do that. But um, now that compliance has a little bit more uh, consequence, um, it's helped, I think, some of those recalcitrant, recalcitrant cities that didn't want to do that uh, get into compliance on that piece. And then I have uh, another question for Kate Gordon. Um, I, I think the idea of uh, leveraging our uh, $7 billion in investments to um, address climate change is a good one. But also speaking for a number of local governments and PERS in general, uh, a lot of governments have unfunded liabilities because of PERS investments. Mm. They haven't uh, realized the return on investment that was expected. and. Um, so I'm just going to ask you, uh, what is what is uh, the government going to do so that they don't sacrifice return on investment for a gain in climate investment leveraging? 
Uh, yeah, that's a great question, and I think it goes back to kind of this fundamental tenet of sort of the entire executive order, which is that none of it supersedes existing sort of law and rules and regulations. There is no, we can't go to PERS and STIRS, I mean, we can't direct them anyway, but this is a collaborative effort. We can't go to PERS and STIRS and say, you know, we would like you to direct your investments these ways and throw, you know, returns out the window. They're, they cannot do that given their responsibility to the investors. They shouldn't do that given fiscal, fiscal responsibility. I think what, what's important is um, that we are seeing a change in how the rest of the market is valuing these types of investments. And so, in, in fact, if CalPERS and CalSTRS don't take the change in conditions, both in terms of physical climate, sort of the, if they don't do a risk analysis in terms of physical climate risk and also what they call transition risk, which is risk of like stranded assets from changes in policy or risk from uh, technology changes. Uh, you know, you put all your money in the combustion engine v in a bucket and don't think about electric vehicles as an example. Um, a uh, classic example is coal investments, which were disrupted pretty dramatically in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, if you don't pay attention to those things, you're actually not taking account material risks. And so you're, you're doing a disservice to your investors. So what we're really saying is, let's look at best practice in terms of investment um, strategy and where the market is going and where, our, we are, what, where we're being pushed by our sort of bond uh, holders and where we're being pushed by insurers and see where we should be going uh, given that reality. So it really is a pretty hard-headed fiscal analysis, um, but, but again, in, in, in one that really takes our climate goals into, into account and, and where the market is going into account. So I just wanted to reassure you, no one is saying throw out the return on investment um, theory. This is a, one of those fundamental tenets that is there, but we are saying, you know, increasingly where the market is going and where investors are going is having to take these things into account as, as material risks. The SEC has asked us to take them into account as material risks. So this is where, where we're going. Thank you. Commissioner Gardino. Th thank you, Vice Chair. Uh, Kate and Zachary, thanks for joining us today, and thanks for all that you professionally do to strengthen our state. Kate, I'm going to take you back to the first comment that I think you made, that we need to uh, uh, strengthen ambition to action. Um, could not agree more. I often hear from my team at the Silicon Valley Leadership Group how much they value working with you, not only because you respond uh, so quickly, but that you proactively reach out as well. And we, my day job, we represent primarily the innovation economy that's driving California. Um, but who we don't represent are the folks who build homes that our families and our workers need to be successful. Uh, I assume both of you uh, do the same type of uh, reactive responsiveness and proactive outreach to home builders yeah. as we look at these joint issues around transportation, housing, air quality, as you do, Kate, with the innovation economy. Are you at liberty to share at all how you do that, how the success is? Because what we often hear, and again, we don't represent home builders, so, uh, but what we often hear is, yes, the city will, will zone as if uh, they are meeting RENA goals, but then they will put so many fees and regulations around what they've zoned that from a practical standpoint, you, you just can't stay in business by, by acting in those jurisdictions. Or again, as we hear from many people in the equity and, and, and uh, justice community, that the lawsuits against more affordable homes near transit uh, using a great law like CEQA are primarily around transit-oriented development. Um, so uh, h how is that outreach going to the folks that actually are in the business of building either affordable or market rate homes so that we can meet any of these collective goals? So um, one of the nice things I, that has happened in the last couple of years that I didn't get the opportunity to talk about was um, in 2017, in the housing package, there was one of the components of that gave us increased 
essentially enforcement authority at HCD. For many, many years, uh, and advocates would always say it, the housing element would have no teeth, right? You know, you had to plan for this, and developers would experience that, and there was very little that could be done. Third-party lawsuits certainly could occur, but that's of great expense at the local level. Um, but with the passage of Assembly Bill 72, we now um, can refer cases to the Attorney General. Obviously, you know, you probably saw earlier in the year, Huntington Beach was sued. Um, and so, um, that has helped significantly get us to better outcomes, to your point, uh, Carl. Um, now that folks know that we have this authority, we, often, we now have a growing unit of folks that we can do investigations and hopefully get to better outcomes before it even gets to some of the things you have identified um, in terms of providing that technical assistance or that notification to the city that, hey, what you're doing may be uh, putting you in violation of the State Housing Accountability Act, and by the way, if you're doing that, then you, know, you may be liable to a lawsuit from the state. So that's one kind of on the enforcement side, and we do hear now quite a bit from developers directly who are now very pleased that we are, can be an ally in helping the good uh, planning occur. The other piece is uh, in housing element, you have to identify constraints to housing and um, things like very high fees or some of the things you identified would be constraints. And um, now that it is that housing element compliance is tied to our enforcement authority, we can get a little more, bit more um, aggressive in uh, if those constraints are not being addressed. And just quickly on that, thanks for the question, uh, Carl. One of the things I love about my job actually is that doing being at OPR and the Strategic Growth Council and the Governor's Advisor on Climate Change, I basically get to talk to everybody about everything all the time because everything is impacted by those things. Um, so I get to spend a lot of time across many communities and, and a big part of what I am doing besides being very responsive, and it's nice to hear people think that I try, um, is, um, is I'm spending a lot of time actually talking to home builders and developers about these very specific questions of where are the barriers that you're actually experiencing on the ground and how do they differ in different regions. And we're doing a lot of, uh, of discussion about how do we actually address those as an, as an administration and really get at them instead of sort of, there's a lot of talking points about what the barriers are and some of them are true and some aren't um, and trying to really get down to the project level and see what people's experience are. We also have a, I have a good relationship with the building trade so I spend a lot of time there as well. Um, and then one of the, I think, most exciting things that we're doing in this administration, you may remember the governor in the state of the state made a really strong point about focusing not just on the coasts and the big cities of the state, but really this idea that all regions rise together in the state and that every part of the state is interconnected and um, interlinked. And so the Regions Rise project, what that's become, is a project Lenny Mendoza from GoBiz and I run. And we have, as part of that project, done listening sessions, full day, and usually more than a day, listening sessions across California. In the last six weeks, San, Ber San Bernardino Merced, just came from Reading this week, um, Bakersfield, uh, River Riverside, I mean, we've been sort of a lot of places, Fresno. Um, and in all of those conversations, I'll tell you what's great about them is that at the regional level, we have a lot of this discussion. There are always developers in the room and there are always folks from Caltrans district director, districts in the room, and there are always people from the community foundations and the EJ community and the equity community in the room. And so it's a place where that conversation is coming together, which is incredibly interesting mm -hmm. and has um, actually contributed a lot to our thinking in general around some of these issues. And if I may inject one more thing, uh, we're only less than two years into some of the new laws that were passed beginning a couple of years ago that do um, give a lot of more leverage to developers in some cases. But what we are hearing quite a bit from them is an unwillingness sometimes to uh, hold local governments to those laws because like we have to continue to work with them for example like we don't want to damage our relationship and so I think over time as this whole suite of things that are essentially progressing cities to more by right approval Senate Bill 35 is one example you can you include a piece of affordability in your project and you meet the criteria around uh, around the environmental standards and other things, then it's a, it's a non-discretionary approval, for example. But we're still seeing that, of course, litigated a little bit on a case-by-case -case basis. But as our hope, as, as that and the suite of other things that have been passed over the last couple of years become more second nature and um, worked through and accepted more, more, more holistically, that we'll see some of that um, hesitancy by developers in terms of, um, you know, pushing that button of utilizing some of those, those authorities um, become more comfort, you know, be, be, become easier to do, right? And not be as worried about um, um, 
what they might perceive as future punitive action in order to uh, allow themselves to, to use those state laws. So I think it is, it does take some time, unfortunately, for those things to become more second nature and part and parcel to the development process. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Butler and then Commissioner Alvarado. Um, so thank you so much again uh, for coming in and sharing with all of us. Really appreciate it. I too am a, a fan of the executive order and, and the promise of, of what it's going to bring. And I, I think we're just in such a different place where we are trying to have these conversations and break out of those silos. And we're, we're having more people talk about and having uh, more people realize that this isn't just a transportation problem or just you know a climate problem or an air problem, that all of these issues are, are interconnected. Um, and, and especially for those of us who, who come at this work from this frame of mobility, knowing how important that being mobile and being able to get where you want to go is also tied to economic mobility and also tied um, to, to having a life um, that is full and that allows you to spend time with your family and is healthy. And so I, I really, I like the direction, I like the narrative that it's going in. I think what's a struggle for me and what I'm really struggling with is even in this conversation, like it, it seems really great, but it also seems really highbrow. Mm. And, it, and it, it seems like part of what's happening is it's not necessarily resonating mm -hmm. um, with everyone. And so, um, Kate, I so appreciate you talking about the fact for there to actually need to be action mm -hmm. um, and for us to actually see the fruits of our labors and having a great vision. How do we, we make that vision a, a reality? And I, I think my, my only other thought, the thing that has stuck out to me the most, my, my colleague in our first comment, um, Member Balms, said, you know, there are so many issues that get buried. Um, and, and we talked about equity. And I think that's true. I think, I, think these, I think these things often get buried. And so I think my ask to you, Zach, is that when, when we start having these conversations, it can't just say like, well, when I have a longer conversation, then that's when equity comes up. And that's when we talk about things like preservation. And that's when we, like, those have to be key. Those have to be, you know, on the early slides. Those have to be coming up um, in, in all of our conversations, yeah. because I do think they get buried. Um, I also think that's not true. I don't think they get buried. I don't think they get buried by low-income people and people of color. And so it's, it's not a surprise to us that there is a lot of traffic as people are getting pushed further out and have to drive further to their jobs yep. because that's the life we live all the time. What's yep. actually happening is now we're in a state where as the disparities continue to grow, people who don't look like me are starting to be impacted by some of these problems and now they want everybody to care. And that's how it feels to low-income people of color. And whether or not that's true, that's how it feels. And so I think my, my question, because I know I'm just talking, I'm not asking a question, but my question is how do we, I, I don't think that it's just that density is a bad word, which I, I totally agree with you, Zach. I think we have to figure out how to just be honest and confront that narrative. I think it's also that like we don't like to talk about racism and we don't like to talk about these hard issues. And like we've, we've all talked around race in our comments, but like that's a lot of, you know, we don't like to talk about what, you know, people who have things, what it means to be surrounded by people who don't and that are poor and that look different than them. And so how are we investing our resources, not just in these visions, but in the actual technical support yep. um, when there isn't that will for folks to do it? Yep. And they were, there will be many reasons they say there's not the will. They don't want to push back on you know, cities. Um, it's more expensive. It's harder. But like, also, let's be honest. Like Our country is based on racism. And there are just some things that like we don't like certain people and we don't want to be by certain people. And so how do we provide financial resources to help people tackle these issues because too often we all get excited and I think we live in a great state where I firmly believe in my heart that people want to do the right thing and they care and they just don't know how in many cases. And so how do we help those folks who want to do equity or do justice? How do we help them realize that you can't just do it if you don't even know how to do it and provide 
um, you know, not just the mechanisms where we can enforce or not just the mechanisms where we can start to look at funding differently, but actually the mechanisms to help people understand how to do it differently and to make it easy for the community-based organizations, um, the community members who know how to do it but aren't viewed as experts. How do we allow them to also be part of the system of helping us make that change? And sorry, I know that's a, a big question, yeah, but I've been a, sitting here for a, a while. Issue so, there, um, you know. Mr. Butler. Um, no, that's a, a obviously critically important question and there's no way that I can answer it fully, except to say a couple of things, because you asked for sort of how do we operationalize this is sort of how I'm hearing you. Um, and, and one thing I think is really important, and you're absolutely right about, is that the, the, the patterns that we're seeing in the state in terms of affordability and driving in people's commutes are affecting people really differently than they used to, and it's both affecting more people, and so I think you're right that we're getting more attention. It's interesting. It's like the fires have always been in really rural areas and then suddenly the air quality got bad in the cities and everyone paid attention. I mean, we're, we do see that dynamic a lot, um, similarly with commute patterns. Um, also though, you know, I think it's forcing an interesting conversation about some of the issues you talked about, about race in particular, that isn't an urban rural split as much as it has been in the past, that we're having an actual sort of much larger geographic conversation about these impacts. Um, and I think that's good, actually. Um, so getting beyond sort of how do we designate this community as this thing and how do we think about, you know, urban poverty in this way and really saying, look, what does this actually look like? Let's go back to the numbers and see what's actually happening here in the state. Um, and, and that is having a much larger and more distributed impact. And I think the big challenge that we have, and it's why the anti-displacement policies have been one of the metrics that's been central and one of the operationalizing things that's been central to the housing conversation is how do we not just have a whole planning conversation that then exacerbates all the same things we've exacerbated in the past? How do we actually kind of build it in from the beginning? Um, anti-displacement policies are a piece of that. Um, the governor, I would say the governor's high road economic development strategy that was in the budget is a piece of that in that what it, what it recognizes, and this is more on the climate side, but it also goes to transportation. Most of the dollars that we spend on our climate policies in the state, the types of jobs they create are construction jobs. And that policy creates a high road construction career ladder that actually includes a pre-apprenticeship program and is very intentional about having a more diverse construction workforce and having the pre-apprenticeship piece of that and paying people to get trained instead of asking people to get trained on their own dime, right? So that's a big program that's now got a huge infusion of money in the budget uh, and is very, it, looking across regions and particularly we found our construction workforce is also moving out of the cities, right? <laughs> because they also can't afford to live in cities and so that, that is a big piece of it is sort of how do we think about the impact on actual workers and how do we think about getting people into that workforce, which is a pretty good workforce, a high road workforce. And again, how do we think about getting jobs to the places people actually live instead of asking everybody to move around uh, for hours and hours at a time. The last thing I'll say is that I'm really proud um, that the, the Strategic Growth Council, which includes the Department of Transportation and many other departments, has actually had proactively adopted a strategy to look specifically at race across all of our programs. And it's, uh, it's called GARE, the under the, which I can never remember what it stands for, so you probably know. Um, you can tell us. I could never remember. Governors. Alliance for Race and Equity. Thank you, thank yeah. you. Um, so, so GARE is run out of um, uh, the Health and All Policies program um, at the state, and it, it's a program. It really is sort of essentially puts this front and center and says you got to think about these issues. Like you have to talk about them, you have to think about them. We have to think about how to operationalize them across our agencies, and that can't just be through how we do HR, which is the usual it's way in, but um, but through actual policy implementation and policy impact. So. All I can say is that there's a lot of, uh, we're thinking through this and struggling with it and would really, really appreciate ideas about how to get from theory to operation in this space. We, unlike with say carbon emissions or road project dollars, we don't have a lot of metrics in the equity space. And so we're working with the ones we have, which are the Cal Enviro screen, honestly, and the, and the anti-displacement policies. But we need more and we need to think it through more strategically. So uh, I really, I'm glad you brought this up because when I do do longer presentations, sometimes I lead with what our strategic plan is at HCD and one of the four tenets of our policy objectives, it's increasing supply at all levels, it's climate change, it's homelessness, and the fourth one we call um, increasing access to opportunity. 
and it does stem from some of our work that we've done at the department with our gear work. But what that means is we have begun to embed in all of our programs and in their guidelines the, the investments, need, the, uh, at least uh, a rewarding, rewarding investments that come in high resource communities, meaning since we're funding affordable housing, um, that we are trying to integrate that, those, that new housing in places that are near resources, right? And without getting in the weed, we have collaborated with a lot of our academic institutions and to the earlier point about tax credits, begun to work with the treasurer's office and actually mapping where those high resource communities are so we can track where the investments are happening so that when we are awarding tax credits, when we, we are scoring our applications, you are rewarded if you are doing investment there. So we're not just only building affordable housing in some areas and we're actually going the other way and saying we want them built in high resource areas. And so that's how we've taken the actual GAIR uh, principles, which certainly we do all the internal stuff as well, but we've tried to make them into action within our programmatic investments and highlight them not only for our stakeholders that are accessing the programs, but we've done a number of internal trainings for our staff around what does, you know, it, it, we found it, it, it was hard as we went with the treasurer's office around these increased access to opportunity maps, what that means, right? Uh, so it allows us to get into the research that shows, from an equity standpoint, um, how people's lives are improved when they live in certain zip codes, those sorts of things, right? And um, we still have work to do, certainly, but um, it has been helpful even to educate our own staff over what that, how, how important embedding those policies are, not even just in our internal practices as a department, but actually walking the walk and putting it into our programs, right? And I will say, it doesn't always get uh, universally uh, agreed with by our stakeholders, but we have held the line and included those in our programmatic updates because we think it's a very important policy objective. Thank you. Ch uh, Commissioner Alvarado. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> and thank you uh, for coming today and, and not only giving it an excellent report, but generating quite a uh, <laughs> conversation around the tables here. Um, this must be socialist corner right here, and I'm going to jump right in the middle of it. Um, you know, there's not, I'm not only a builder, but I'm an investor. And, you know, inner city high density development or any high density develop around a transit uh, hub is the most expensive front door you could build. And so when you look at, um, you know, the for-profit developer side, uh, like I say, not only my builder, I'm an investor. I run a pension fund. Um, we we come in with prospectus with an 18 to 28 percent internal rate of return. So you know it's risky, it's expensive, yeah. uh, long time approval process. And then on the other side, uh, because we're pension plan, we've made a decision uh, to do some social investing. So we will give up a point or two in that internal rate of return and work with the nonprofit side. And when you look at those two dynamics, they are both competing for the same land. They're both competing for uh, the same workers. They're both competing for, through the same approval process. I think the government needs to make a, a real hard decision and maybe give a leg up for three or four or five years on the nonprofit side. Because even if you build, you get a, a development through um, the affordability component um, is maybe 11 to 13 percent. And when you factor in all those other, um, you know, to make a pencil out, return your investors and make a profit, now you're talking about even an affordable unit that a tradesperson can't afford, like you had mentioned. So we need to really look at it's serious government investment in housing. And, you know, I'm, they don't like to call them projects, but they're communities. I'm a product of the projects. It's not, it's not a hurdle that you can't, uh, I mean, it's not a label that you can't, that, that's derogatory. But we need to make serious government investment in housing to make sure that everybody can can have a roof over their head. And if you look at, at, uh, at when we talked about PERS, um, there's, a different, there's a different mindset. They have a different set of problems, have a different set of investment guidelines. 
but there is a place, um, and we were, it was called the social investment, and in the different conferences that we go to, try to portray it as illegal because you're not, you're not getting the best investment uh, for your participants. But it comes with, with, um, it comes with strings, obviously. You know, you have to use apprentices, you have to use community workers, um, all of that that goes with developing in community. And a lot of kids that come in through pre-apprenticeship programs that work on these projects, you know, they get a job on these projects, then they qualify to live in these, on these projects. So it's going to take a different mindset. You know, you cannot continue to push for an 18 to 28 percent internal rate of return and expect to make any difference. Because then you end up with a situation like the good doctor mentioned, where you're displacing people and, and you're going to drive to where you qualify. Yep. So, you know, the second part of that is you need to make it affordable. It's going to take some steps. Nothing's going to happen overnight. But in the meantime, we need to rethink the way that we do public transit. Public transit doesn't work. It's, you know, um, you can put a train from Sacramento to San Francisco. That doesn't help the plumber. It doesn't help the carpenter. It doesn't help the hotel worker. It doesn't help the people who really need to get that commute shortened. You need to make, you need to make, a, you need to make public transit work. And we need to figure out a way to, um, I live in Pinole. Um, in Contra Costa County, we have three, four different transit agencies. Even more. Even more. Why, why do we have that? I mean, there's right outside my front door, on the side of my driveway, there's a bus stop. A block away from my office in Oakland, there's another bus stop. That's a three and a half hour commute. Nobody's going to do it. Not for 37 miles, which is what my yep. front door to my office door is. Three and a half hours for 37 miles is a failure of the public transit system. So whether it's, whether it's, uh, and you know, one of, the, one of the segments of public transportation that works is the on demand. Yep. You know, the ride share, we have that at yep. Westcat, that little mm -hmm. yep. ride share for senior citizens to get to the market and their, and their appointments. Maybe that should become more of, of a portion of our public uh, transportation system, but we've we've got to somehow think that come up with the mindset that says, okay, it's going to come in steps, and not everybody's going to go at the same pace. So maybe we need to put housing first. In the meantime, we still need to put capacity on our roads because we do have a commute problem, and until we can start shifting that population back to where the job centers are, you know, it, it, that's what's going to have to happen. And, and take it from there. <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's not an easy problem to solve. I admire you guys for putting the work into this. Um, but I, I think until we solve the housing problem, nothing else is we can do anything we want. And it's going to be very difficult. Because you know, like the good doctor said, it's those folks that travel the longest don't really have the most efficient, cleanest modes of transportation. And it's, we should be able to provide at least a portion of it um, in, in a safe, economical, and timely manner. Thank you. Uh, Chair Nichols. Thank you. <laughs> oh, Paul. Yes. Thank you. Um, oh, Paul, oh, okay. more questions? Okay. Okay. Um, yes. yes, sorry. Please. Sorry, no Commissioner Keogh, I, I, I didn't see you. No problem. Thanks. Uh, it has been a fascinating and complicated discussion on, from the panelists and from uh, the board members and the commission members. Um, this, what we're trying to do, to, has so many tentacles, so many tentacles that uh, it's, uh, it is, you know, I guess I want to say mind blowing because it is. So um, I just want to inject a little note of political practicality. Uh, because when we talk about 
these forward-looking uh, policies that we are, some are already on the books and we're going to be doing more in the next few years. Uh, the um, implementation at the local level, at the city and county level, um, is uh, necessarily, or not necessarily, but it's fraught with, um, I think, some contention uh, for uh, the resident that sees a neighborhood improvement, another one may see gentrification. Uh, for uh, the people who want to put in an accessory dwelling unit on their property, um, that's a great step forward for some, or maybe it's an Airbnb rental that will be m vacant most of the time. Um, and we don't even have basic numbers on things like that in San Diego. There's still some discussion about whether it's five or even 10,000 units that are off the market um, on a, you know, a semi-permanent basis because of uh, short-term vacation rentals. So there's a, a, a lot of different aspects of this, and I think we need to persuade Californians about what we perceive as the benefits, whether it's going to be um, better housing for the next generation or right now, whether it's home ownership or uh, rental units, uh, whether we're going to have more diverse communities, uh, whether we are going to be able to get around without cars uh, or with much cleaner cars. We haven't really r done uh, a successful sales job. We need we need better marketing, and I'm sure you know that. Um, we, we really need to, I think, look at uh, some of the housing policies we're implementing right now uh, with um, higher density uh, development along transit corridors. We're actually pushing people out of existing owner, home, homes that are there. They may be uh, older, less appealing rental units and little courtyards and one and two story apartment buildings, but people live there and they're being uh, pushed out. And in some cases, actually the next step is homelessness. So we're putting people in the homeless pipeline while we're attempting to take them out at the, uh, at the other end. So I think we need to, and I think you have the resources, Kate. When you look at OPR's uh, purview, the agencies that you have that you can call on for advice are, are right there, but we really need to give more detailed thought to what the practical application is of these high-level discussions. So I, I just want to put that Thank on the you. table before we wrap up. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. Okay, uh, now Chair Nichols. Uh, thank you. Uh, I, I think this is a question and a comment both. Um, so uh, what we're learning, I think, in part from trying to actually implement these policies is how difficult it is to keep everybody else's priorities in mind at the same time when you're carrying out what your own agency's primary mission is. And so I guess one of the questions I would just ask of our colleague um, from uh, HCD is whether you feel that you are able to apply or to utilize a climate lens or a climate filter as you develop the policies that you're now working on and whether there's additional tools that would be good to have if you're, you know, as you're trying to do this. Uh, I mean, yes, I do. I, I, I'm not sure if you were in the room when I said, you know, climate is one of our four tenets of the things we're trying to achieve in terms of effectuating the state's climate goals. And so many of our programs obviously seek to do that directly. Uh, when it comes to the planning aspects of things, you know, we want to push um, and now have greater tools to do so within the th our authority. We want to push local communities to um, do better kind of planning and development that are climate centered. Uh, in the past, before we, you know, I mentioned there was this belief and probably truth that housing element law didn't have very much teeth because there wasn't much consequence. You know, they give us a site inventory and we kind of have to accept what it might be, right? Um, there's a little bit more of an iterative process that we're now able to go through. And so what we've been, uh, especially this past year, but uh, it precedes this, so certainly the, the housing and transportation working group has, has, has been helpful. Um, I think tools to our disposal, for example, uh, I'll give a very, very specific example, right? We may get a community that says, you know, we can't plan for any housing because we don't have any access to water, or we can't do any sort of water improvements. Well, you know, it's hard for our analysts who are not maybe well-versed in that to, 
to know if that's true or not, because we definitely know there's times when that's not true when that's said to us, you know, because it may just be a uh, way a community doesn't want to have to uh, accommodate housing needs. So we have begun conversations, for example, with partners on our wa on the water side, so we can validate those questions um, when they come up. So. Uh, I think we need, we need more of that. I mean, that's just one example. But the, the, certainly when you speak to tools, being able to have conduits at our, at our partner agencies for when local governments are telling us things that we can uh, validate so we don't just accept what they're saying as fact. Uh, oh, we have to plan for here because of X, Y, and Z. We can't plan here where you're telling us to plan because of X, Y, and Z. So as we can have the tools not supposed to push them towards those better planning outcomes, um, we can tap into, for example, um, the expertise of our partners. And I think being a part of this group will certainly help that. Um, it's already borne fruit with our collaborations um, at the working group levels. Um, but as they come up, I think that may be the request we may be asking, not only the folks around this room, but other state partners when we have specific um, cases at the local level where we need to, uh, or we may be doing investigation now with our new enforcement authority where uh, something is being alleged. Um, to maybe receptivity to our, 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 our asking our state partners for uh, advice and, uh, and getting it, yeah. Does that, that answer your question? Yes, I mean, I think, yes, oh. I think so. Uh, the, perhaps the underlying um, issue here uh, was odd by mind was that when we were in Los Angeles for our meeting, we were addressed by a, an attorney on behalf of a group that is alleging that our entire scoping plan is a violation of civil rights and environmental justice uh, policies because uh, we are, in uh, their view, um, uh, making it more difficult for people to achieve home ownership as a result of everything that we do, basically. Um, and so it's kind of a direct attack on the, the policies and the premises behind uh, the scoping plan. So I think we, uh, uh, we're just looking for um, what the correct way to respond to this is, because this is not our uh, area. Yeah. We think that we do a lot in the area of environmental justice and that we do not violate civil rights laws. So I'm not suggesting that we are in agreement with the lawsuit, but we are interested in making sure that we know how in a proactive way um, we can address those kinds of concerns. So. Thank you. Uh, just really quickly on that, thank you, Chair Nichols. Um, I think that the recognition that housing is a climate issue is dawning to a lot of folks. It, it has previously been, as you know well, We've thought a lot about green buildings and the individual building envelope and how efficient is it and does it have solar on it. And we're now really starting to see this integration um, and the, of the, with the land use issue as, a, as a, a really significant climate issue, not just in California, but around the world. Um, so that recognition is slow to dawn in the environmental community as well as in other communities. And, and that's work that you've done a lot on and, and I think everyone is kind of is, is pushing for. It's partly educational. But the other piece, and I would really point to one of Zach's slides as really important, is housing is not affordable if the transportation costs make it unaffordable. Mm -hmm. So affordable housing is also has to integrate the idea of what the transportation costs are associated with that housing. It is not affordable to live two and a half hours away from a job mm -hmm. that pays you the same amount as if you lived to two minutes away from that job. It's a not a sustainable situation. And I think the more we all can incorporate that idea into the, the, the concept of affordability and access, the better. Thank you. Okay. Um, I did have questions, but um, we are we really going over. So I'm going to make two <laughs> points, and, and we can talk offline. Uh, uh, Director Gordon, on your last slide, you had two points that I thought were very critical. Yep. Stakeholder engagement will be key throughout the process. And I would just say that there are two cultures in this state. There's the culture of, of um, laying out uh, something and, and trying to push it down, yeah. and there's a culture of laying out a big goal and then going to the bottom and engaging and saying, okay, let's rise up a solution to meet that, that yep. big goal. So I would, I would just inc really encourage um, the, 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 the Transportation Commission has always followed the ladder yeah. and that's an important part of our culture. Second thing is um, implementation will respect legal boundaries and will not affect already committed funds. Yeah. Keep in mind that there's an enormous sensitivity to that I within know. our culture as well. <laughs> Yes. And, and, and sometimes um, people might say, well, that's a not, what you believe is not committed, 
may be perceived in the uh, our local partners as being a, a, a committed fund. Uh, so those are the two things. Yep. I'd love to get into them if, you, if you're around, we can, but we have to move on. Great, so thank, thank you, you, you very, points. very much. Thank you. Obviously, you were very popular, <laughs> uh, so you, you really engaged the, the commission and the board. So I am gonna do a chair's prerogative. We are running very long. If you must go to, to go to the restroom, no one will judge you for going to the restroom. <laughs> However, we are going to move right to the next panel. So if I could have the next panel come up right now and set up, I would appreciate it because I'm being uh, told that I am not managing this meeting well and I felt like everyone's nervous that we're way, way over time. So I need to, we need to make up time. Mr. Vice Chair, it depends on which time zone. That That's right. In, so That's right. You, you we're doing right great right for the Hawaiian time zone right now. You're welcome, Chris. Well, and the speaker of the same comes out. Thank you. Um, our next uh, panel is a very important panel. Um, it's a discussion on the sustainable transportation planning and project implementation with the San within the San Joaquin Valley. Uh, our moderator today will be uh, San Jose County Supervisor for District 2, Vito Chiesa. Uh, our panelists will be Christine Kai. Christine, you got to wave bigger. Thank you. There you go. Aaron Hakimi from Kern County. Terry Keene from Kings County, uh, Trish Taylor from Madera County, Andy Chesley from San Joaquin County, Rosa Park from Stanislaus County, and Pastor Ted from Tulare County. Uh. <laughs> All right, I will now turn it over to our moderator for this panel, Vito Chiesa. He disappeared like the two boards. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Paul. It is great that you have chosen the CTC and the Air Board to come to Modesto. Uh, so I welcome you. I know you've been welcomed many times today, but thank you very much for coming down here. We will try and keep this short to get you back on time. Uh, it is always a pleasure to see Supervisor Serna and Supervisor Joy. I know he's around. We've been in many battles together uh, through CSAC and our very own John Eisenhut, member Eisenhut. 
from Turlock. Okay, so quickly you introduced everyone. We're going to get right into the questions, and I'll kind of try and prompt uh, each one of the speakers if I could, uh, and if you keep your answers pretty concise. Uh, I know that the time is of the essence. Uh, the first question I wanted to ask, or I wanted to talk about, is the Valley is working on some interesting concepts utilizing climate investment funds. Uh, tell us about some current innovations uh, the, that support the use of electric vehicles. I'm going to start with Kern County Representative Aaron Akimi. Thank you. Thank you, Vito. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for inviting us to speak here. So the Eight Valley Cogs got together about six years ago and uh, invested about half a million dollars in grant funds in studying Interstate 5 and Interstate 99. One of the things that came out of that study was uh, the need to look into much further the ability to move freight in the Central Valley emissions free. So we, we are about to start uh, with an investment of about $200,000 from all the counties together, mostly from Kings County, thank you Terry, uh, in partnership with the Air Resources Board, uh, the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District, and hopefully Caltrans also will per be participating in this study. What we're specifically going to study is the viability of uh, heavy trucks traveling the roughly 225 miles from the base of the grapevine on the uh, Kern County side all the way up to the 580 turnoff. That's about 225 miles. We're going to study the ability to do that emissions free uh, with either electric vehicles, hydrogen powered vehicles, or, or the sh shuttling of, uh, of vehicles. So uh, imagine a vehicle that could come from the Port of Long Beach, drop off a 40-foot container on the Kern County side, and that trip could be done uh, with zero emissions, and then have that container travel another 225 miles up through the Central Valley, one of the most polluted areas in, in the country, completely emission-free, and then be delivered on its last leg in the Bay Area emissions-free. We believe uh, that that is viable today, and this study is going to explore the commercial viability of that, not just with, say, delivering potato chips, as, as you may have uh, read about. Frito-Lay is heavily investing in zero-emission vehicles, but we want to be able to do it with uh, full 80,000-pound loads. We look forward to a, a successful partnership. Uh, and thank you to the Air Resources Board for being a partner and to the San Joaquin Valley Air Pollution Control District. And I look forward to Caltrans also partnering with us. That's great. Ted, maybe you can talk a little bit about MioCar, your experience with MioCar, and how you see it playing out in the future, maybe what the public perception is. Well, MioCar, just so, you, so we can be brief, there's a write up in your pamphlet. Um, it's a car sharing uh, partnership that we've started. Um, you can look in there with partnerships with uh, um, ARB, the partnership with um, our, air, our own pollution control district, Kern County, and ourselves, and UC Davis. And um, it's just got started, but we already have over 100 active members. Uh, we've had 300 reservations since coming to Tulare County, and this is an increase from the 82 active members and 50 reservations from just a month ago. So we are very excited, although it's in infancy. This is a new way to help folks out. Um, keep in mind we're rural. Some of the suggestions about, um, you know, car demand companies um, don't exactly work in other areas. But car sharing is a great opportunity for us to help people out, and we look forward to this continuing to be successful. That's good. Terry from Kings County, Calvans, I think that's something that's important. It's, it's primarily used as an agricultural, uh, for agricultural workers, but do you see that expanding? How has it worked in your county? Well, actually, it didn't start out as a farm worker van pool program. It started out with our local transit agency. We have uh, uh, some large employers within our county, three state prisons alone in Kings County, as well as the Naval Air Station. So their employees were looking for transit, so we started a regular van pool program. And then those vans were used, particularly for the prisons, they have like three shifts. So that 
bands are running 24 hours a day, so there's a lot of turnover in the bands. So those bands were turned over to a startup a farm worker program, okay. and that just expanded quite a bit. And so um, with the help of the Air Resources Grants, um, they are receiving for the farm worker band pool program electric vehicles to expand that program. Currently, it operates the, the, it got so big, so in 2012, they established their own entity. So there are 18 counties uh, that are members of this entity, and um, there's over 18, 800 vans in total overall. And just within the San Joaquin Valley, there's 376, and just within Little Old Kings County, there's 66 vans. Uh, that includes both the regular van pool and the farm worker van pool. So, um, in terms of the benefits that we're receiving from that, uh, in fiscal year 1819, last reported, there were about 11 million miles carrying 3 million passengers. And then, uh, from the latest data we have regarding emission reductions from 1617, shows a reduction of 52.5 metric tons of, of uh, emission reductions as a result of Calvans use. And so with the additional use expanding, that'll only increase the emission reductions. So just within San Joaquin Valley alone, van pools traveled 7 million miles with over 2 million passengers. And then in just little old Kings County, we had 1.3 million miles with about 400,000 pass 400, passengers. So that was about 5.8 metric tons of emission reductions just within Kings County alone. So we rely heavily on those programs to meet our um, SB 375 goals and the state's goals for emission reductions within Kings County and the whole valley. Is it funded solely by the Air Board? No, the no. regular van pool program is funded by a rider um, fares. They also receive vouchers for their employers and from the Air District. So. It's, it's quite an incentive to use a van pool program. Um, but they receive funds through the farm worker of the farm uh, that they go to work to. So being in the valley with the agriculture, there's quite a, a few vans running around, include going over to the Central Coast. So all the ag areas within the state are operating uh, cow vans. Perfect. Uh, Mr. Smalley, tell us about one low carbon project in the Valley, um, transit project. Sure, we right now have a shuttle service that gets our uh, college students up to the four-year college in Fresno. It actually was built off of what we did eight years ago, which is to work with the community college in a partnership to where the students just show their ASB card anywhere in our county or sister county, Kings County, and they get to ride any bus. They just show their card. And since then, we've had 2.4 million riders in our two counties having access to community college. Um, the city of Isaiah had a vision of how do we now help our kids get to the four-year university? And that's where the LC Top money came in. And it was uh, a great use of money. And now we have a shuttle that's been going on for three years that not only goes to the college, but also goes to the International Airport up in Fresno. <laughs> And our ridership's up to 3,000 students now. And so we're excited about the ability to continue to help kids have access and grow in education. Perfect. Next question. Um, we talk about the availability of land, uh, cheaper labor over in the San Joaquin Valley. We've, it's spurred tremendous growth, especially in the distribution area. Uh, how are we accommodating this growth for goods movement? And how are we going to mitigate all of the truck traffic, growth in VMTs and such? I'm going to start with Andy Chesley, who probably is the most impacted here from San Joaquin County. Sure. You know, from the beginning, back in the gold rush days, San Joaquin County at the northern part of the San Joaquin Valley has always been a logistics center, whether it be to, for gold rush uh, participants to head to the, to the mountains. And it continues to be that way today. I've mentioned here in front of both the commission and in front of uh, the board that uh, six years ago, Amazon had no employees in San Joaquin County. Today, they're our largest employer. Uh, distribution is making a big impact in San Joaquin County. Wayfair just opened up a $1.1 million uh, warehouse facility um, and there are seven under construction in San Joaquin County. Uh, that will uh, 
bring 70 trucks an hour are uh, being deposited on the Highway 120 from Wayfair. Uh, at the Port of Stockton, which is uh, the fourth largest port in the state of California, and admittedly there's a, a bit of a difference between the Port of Oakland and the Port of Stockton uh, in terms of tonnage, uh, but uh, we are doing several things uh, with the help of the Commission and the uh, delivery of Caltrans. Uh, we've been able to move uh, trucks out of a uh, um, a uh, social justice uh, community um, uh, out of that and to uh, have a, a big impact and the betterment of that particular community. We are moving uh, uh, more uh, movement of goods onto rail with rail improvements um, on both the site as well as off-site uh, from the Port of Stockton. And we have had an effort uh, which has not always, has not been totally successful, which is to uh, move truck traffic from uh, off the Altamont Pass onto barges coming from the Port of Oakland to the Port of Stockton. The operating cost of that has been way too high, uh, and we've had to suspend that, but we are looking for ways to put that back into effect uh, here, hopefully in the near future. And, and I might also point out, you see Merced is not uh, here because we didn't have enough chairs for Merced, so they're <laughs> out in the hallway, but uh, they're trying to do an inland port to take containers down to the port of LA. And I know it's been tried in Stanislaus to try and get uh, a, a shortcut over to the port of Oakland uh, for container ships to take people off of the Altima. So there's a lot of things happening. Uh, Tricia from Madeira, can you please talk about the need to complete the SR911 widening uh, through the San Joaquin Valley? Good morning. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, the San Joaquin, the State Route 99 is the Good Movement's uh, workhorse of California. And I know I don't need to share that with all of you. You're all well aware of all the goods that are, are transported from the farm to market. Um, but it is of crucial importance that we ensure safe mobility and efficient mobility on the state highway. Um, both local and regional travelers who share the facility with constant freight transportation. So we need to be aware of all the, the local travel as well as the freight movement on State Route 99. The intent behind the state um, Prop 1B funds was to relieve the system of forecasted congestion and consequences that congestion brings, which is pollution, public health, travel times, the economy. Um, and But today we are experiencing gaps. And so the State Route 99 still needs to be completed. The gaps have created, um, have created traffic congestion along, along the highway. And in Madera, I can speak specifically to Madera, and I know that we see this um, up and down the State Route 99, is that it's continuing to get worse. And on an annual basis, the rate of collisions has been increasing. Uh, travel times increase, leading to slowed and often stopped vehicles on the state highway. And all these factors continue to create worse emission outputs. Additionally, we are more often to observe an influx of traffic off of State Route 99. I, mean, I experienced this yesterday. I did it myself. We were, going, we're leaving State Route 99 due to tra traffic congestion and going on to our local streets and roads, which is causing safety um, issues for our, our communities. Having said that, we know of and we strive to find many solutions to address our ambitious goals in our urban and rural communities. And so we're working, and I know you've heard from um, my colleagues here that there are a lot of other um, alternatives that we are looking at to address getting either trucks off the roads or any kind of alternative <laughs> modes of transportation. State Route 99 is the transport artery capturing everything from local to national travel. Um, and completing what is needed on State Route 99 is an important piece of that big picture that we are trying to address to meet all of our goals. And so the need to complete State Route 99 is of great importance to us in order for us to also address some of the other needs along this, the State Highway. Perfect. Thank you. So the eight of us is a make up part of the Regional Policy Council made up of the eight Valley Counties. We do a DC lobbying trip every year. And one of the main topics and t uh, from Tulare Cog is that there's a real issue going on with uh, trucks using local roads. And Tulare has, uh, I, I guess I'll ask you, Ted, what are you doing about that uh, to get to dairies, to get to almond hullers, processing plants? Well, two things. One, I think we are 
trying to educate at the federal level when we talked about goods movement, the need of truly farm to market or farm to processing that um, most transportation funds are divvied up by population based and not based on um, the amount of miles. And we need to look at especially farming areas like ours, which is so critical to the country. We produce so much milk, um, uh, comes out of at, uh, the amount of cheese and things that we produce is astronomical. And yet it takes a lot of roads to have those dairies. It takes a lot of roads to provide the citrus. Um, the San Joaquin Valley is the largest agricultural area in the whole country, and it's not even close. And it's not just large by volume, it's large by quality. The quality of what's produced in here is second to none in the world. Uh, people all over the world want the produce, want the milk, and I think that's pretty um, famous about China wanting the milk because it's safe and what's happened to deaths in their country. But it takes a lot. And so one is lobbying the federal government to look at um, ways that um, in the next transportation bill, a pilot program could occur um, that would have additional funding based on the amount of pure truck traffic that is on rural roads. Um, in addition to that, we are prioritizing our funds based on truck traffic that is on roads. To give you an example, one filled up milk container equals um, 16 to 18,000 cars as far as its wear and tear on the road. So when we have roads that have 600 truck trips a day, um, it's hard to imagine, but it's the equivalent of having millions of cars a day on that road beating it up. So I, I think one is you certainly have to prioritize the funds you have, but two, it's time for us to look at the full picture of what farm to market is, which starts where the food's produced, where the milk's produced, and help be able to um, have funding to take care of those roads. Thank you very much. So the Valley faces some unique challenges, more than, especially in the North Valley, more than 80,000 people leave our area to go to the Bay Area for their employment. How does this impact our land use decisions, transportation decisions, and what are you doing to address it? I'm gonna start with Rosa. Maybe you can talk about the commute shed, what it's doing uh, regard to housing production, and what ARCOG's doing uh, to help out. Thank you. Yes, um, obviously the Central Valley remains one of your fastest growing um, areas in California, and for, for our, particularly in the Stanislaus region, we are looking at other ways to try to help some of our commuters. Uh, ACE extension rail coming to our, our area is going to, we hope that it's gonna help us get some of those commuters um, uh, on, on our rail, but also our transit stations. We're making improvements on our transit stations to improve and be ready for um, our rail service to get here. Uh, also, with, with our, uh, we're very optimistic with um, uh, the, uh, the new uh, AB 185 with the housing and having those conversations with the COGS as we work together with these, with you know, getting uh, improvements. Also with uh, AB 101, we're very happy to know that with, the, with our COG and our regents here to work together with our RENA process. And I feel that collectively we will improve um, these commute uh, patterns. Okay. Christine, you're from the Fresno COG. Pretty much the same question, and how we're going to address the GHG reductions. That's right. Thank you. So, um, suburban greenfield development is still the primary type of development in the valley, and still outnumbers outgrows infill and redevelopment. There's a couple of uh, underlying reasons for that. Uh, first, greenfield development is cheaper, and uh, since the redevelopment money went away, it has been hard for the redevelopment um, to pencil out, especially in the uh, urban, the ex existing urban core downtown areas. And secondly, in the valley, we have a younger population. Um, our household size is bigger, and while the entire state is uh, exper experiencing a decline of household size, the valley actually, our household size is growing. So with a family of three or four kids, um, the f such family will be looking for uh, spaces. So, so those are the 
couple of reasons. Um, there's an impact to that kind of suburban greenfield development because uh, it will be hard for us to achieve density, which will be hard for transit to work in our regions. So uh, that's why, you know, um, majority are, of our residents are still, are still relying on their own private cars. And, you know, the transit motion in the valley is you know, around 2 percent ish. So the, the, the land you spend, you know, uh, doesn't help with the transit ridership. But the valley, we are working really hard to try to uh, address that, uh, both from, uh, with trans transportation and land use strategies. So at Fresno Cog, we have a TOD program funded by our local sales measure. Uh, it provides uh, funding to actually offset the impact fees for housing developments along the transportation BRT corridors in downtown area, of course, at the required density and uh, close to transit. The local government level, uh, like City of Fresno, they have actually streamlined their planning process, per permitting process for uh, housing development to go along the BRT corridor and the downtown Fresno. Um, and City of Fresno, they have a tiny home program for their old town, actually, um, you know, to encourage homeowners in their old town to build accessory dwelling units, either for rental or for, for their family members. And the designs have been paid for uh, by the city and the permitting process has been uh, streamlined. So um, while we're working really hard on encouraging development to go into the uh, BRT corridors in downtown area, we do recognize that the land use development that uh, pattern in the valley cannot be changed overnight. So we are also working on different transportation strategies to address um, GHG impact. Uh, like uh, Terry mentioned, we all of us are active participants on the CalVan programs. And uh, Fresno Cog, and I believe many uh, Valley Cogs, we're all actively working on our EV charger programs to look at valley-wide or county-wide deployment of EV chargers. We do believe that um, long-term, um, when many people drive EVs, then the GHG impact could be mitigated for even for suburban uh, growth. Thank you. Uh, Andy, you have the ACE train, which I know is a big point, and there's the potential expansion in the future. Maybe you could talk about how that's working. Sure. The Altamont Corridor Express may be the best example of the exacerbated jobs housing imbalance in the state of California. Um, I want to thank uh, Commissioner Gardino, who was one of the early advocates uh, for the ACE train service back in the 1990s. Uh, today, it carries over 1.5 million passenger trips and is growing at a rate of about 5 to 8 percent per year in terms of ridership. One of the uh, the great challenges that we face in San Joaquin County in terms of providing for the operating costs around this is that uh, for the ACE rider, uh, their household uh, median income is a little over $100,000. Uh, for uh, our regional bus transit, the uh, median household income is a little over $30,000 a year. Um, but ridership on the uh, regional transit system is dropping uh, as opposed to the increases that are, we're experiencing on the ACE service. Uh, the challenge here in terms of both uh, social equity issues of being able to provide enough funding to keep ACE operations going, but at the same time not stealing away from the bus ridership is a, is a challenge. In fact, our board a couple of weeks ago uh, adopted a policy to shift about $5 million of road and street funding a year uh, uh, over to public transit to both uh, help along with the ACE service as well as to make sure we're supporting our our local regional transit district service. Uh, these are uh, people on the ACE service are hardy people. Uh, you may be, uh, if you get on the first train out of Stockton, it's at 4.20 a.m. in the morning. Uh, and it's not unusual for folks to actually uh, commute from Stockton to uh, Palo Alto, for instance. And that's, uh, while you may spend two hours on the train, you're actually spending over three hours in your commute uh, to do that. Um, uh, there was a New York Times article of a woman who uh, commutes to San Francisco, working at the Federal Reserve. Um, her commute is, uh, in total, is about 14 hours a day. Um, and so you can see the kind of challenges that people are willing to take on for lower housing costs. Um, and that's a, a true challenge in terms of this jobs, housing, and balance that we're facing in California. In San Joaquin County, we are effectively the epicenter of that challenge. Yeah. So I guess in the South Valley, Aaron, you have the exact opposite problem. They're going south rather than north. Uh, what is Kern doing to Kern County doing to address that? 
Uh, first of all, uh, Supervisor, the, the numbers uh, going out of county are, are much, much smaller in Kern County um, than they are in San Joaquin County. But since our county is so big, uh, over 8,000 square miles, about the size of Connecticut, we have significant commutes uh, within the county. As an example, my former board chairman commutes every day from Wasco to, to Tehachapi, that's 70 miles. Um, we regularly have people commuting from Tehachapi, which is uh, Eastern Current, into Bakersfield. That's about a 50-mile commute. Uh, there, are, there are commutes from Eastern Kern to, uh, to Bakersfield, which is over a 100-mile commute. Uh, to give you an idea, that there are five state prisons. Those are major employers in, in Kern County, one federal pr uh, prison. We have Edwards Air Force Base in Eastern Kern, China Lake uh, Naval Base. Um, so to, to answer your, your question, what are we doing about it? I, I employ someone full-time on my COG staff to do nothing but uh, awareness about carpooling, van pooling. Uh, she visits um, she visits the Air Force Base, the, the prisons, major employers uh, in the, Terry already mentioned, in the San Joaquin Valley portion of Kern County. Cal, Cal vans is, is a great deal. Uh, if you're a federal uh, employee or a state employee, like someone who works at the prison or one of these bases, your commute is is covered 100%. You can commute for free if you're willing to to share a van with with your your coworkers. Sometimes that becomes a challenge, and that's the biggest reason why people leave uh, leave van pools, uh, at least in Kern County, is because they can't get along with with their f fellow employers. It's it's not cost. <laughs> L literally, we uh, with the incentives, they can commute for free. Their commu commute costs are free. Uh, and on, on a pers uh, personal note, we also have um, a program that matches carpool, carpools and van pools, but the um, commercial uh, companies and private companies are getting into that. I use Google Maps regularly. I get uh, a notice every morning on my phone how long my commute will uh, be expected to take. I also use Waze when I travel in Los Angeles. Uh, it's a little creepy, but, but Waze uh, sends me notice, notices that, hey, there's someone else that lives in your neighborhood that has a very similar to commute. Do, do you want to uh, start carpooling with, with, with them? Uh, both Lyft and Uber have carpooling apps now that, that we um, let people know about. Uh, there are definitely privacy issues. That's why you know I sort of uh, wondered why I was getting this random text about someone else in my neighborhood commuting, but it has the potential uh, to, uh, has the potential for many, many more people to carpool or van pool. Perfect. Now I want to just ask the rural counties really quick, either Tricia or Terry, either one, uh, how is this affecting uh, you in a rural county? Does it affect you? Do you think there's any place for active transportation type planning also in rural, more rural counties? Well, I'll, I'll start out. Um, it, it, I think Kings County has a bubble around it. Uh, we don't really have that issue with interregional travel. Most of ours is, is in intra-regional travel. Um, just within Kings County, the prisons are located in the south part of the rural part of the county, whereas the city of Hanford and the county seat is in the north part. So people who need to get to county facilities must go a long distance. So we do have transit service that does what it can, but as Andy mentioned, ridership is down. Uh, what we have done is try to modify schedules um, and routes. Uh, one thing we did institute was called a flex route. Uh, at the end of the day, when ridership is down, instead of having one passenger wants to go from here to there, instead of going to 10 stops to where he wants to go, he just on his phone say, I'm at this stop, I want to go here. So it's like taxi service almost. So it's a much shorter trip, much more efficient. You don't have empty buses running around, so it's a cost savings as well. Also, um, our transit operator also has um, a phone app, so they know exactly where the bus is, when it's going to get there, if there's any issues. So uh, we're making transit more efficient, which is key to getting passengers on buses. So um, 
just need to do more, find out where they need to go, where they need to go, where they're coming from, what their purpose is, and I think we can we can do a lot better. But uh, we do have transit service that goes to um, in the morning from Kings County goes over to Tulare County for educational. Uh, some of the colleges there and, and business schools, as well as medical service to Fresno County. So those are kind of specialized trips. We do provide in, uh, interregional service just within our small transit service. And then we did um, just recently update or prepare our active transportation plan, so we're already implementing that. Uh, City of Hanford uh, spent almost a million dollars in um, safe routes to school type projects. Um, I've seen pictures in urban areas where they receive grants uh, for sidewalks, where they already have sidewalks, where we don't have sidewalks, and so we want to put in sidewalks. So it's a little bit different in the rural areas how to meet our needs, but that's how we do it. Perfect. I'm going to stop the questioning there because I promised I was going to get you back on time. I did make a couple of notes really quick. I just, um, I always do this as people are talking. You see we're all the same, but we're all very different. The eight valley counties, um, we're in a difficult airshed. Everyone knows that, but it is a priority by what you've heard from each of the COG directors today, whether it's through CalVans, whether it's through the San Joaquin Joint Powers Authority, the uh, Amtrak system or ACE train. And 99 is obviously a priority. I think you heard that too, and I, I don't have to tell you. And there's a lot of pass-through pollution that comes from trucks. The partner we consider the San Joaquin uh, Valley Air Pollution Control District a great partner. I think we've reduced about 90%, if I remember the number right, and we have to reduce another 90% uh, to reach attainment. So it's still a challenge, and mobile sources are not under their control. But uh, again, we are partners. Look at us as partners and trying to, to do better. And uh, we continue to look forward to partnering with both with the CTC and the the uh, California Air Resources Board on a go-forward basis. Again, thank you very much. It is harvest time for me. Paul knows that, yeah, the you, chairman. So you can ask questions of these folks, and I'm going to uh, you can head go. back out to the field. I know that the that <laughs> wallet trailer is ready to go into Blue Diamond, uh, go to Diamond Wallet right now, and it's what your dad's like so tapping the, his watch. The saying is I only work 30 days out of the year on the farm, and this would be one of the 30 yeah, days. So yeah. <laughs> I don't want to be disowned. All right. hey, thank you very thank much. Thank you, Vito. Okay, well, we'll go to questions now, and Before I know I have quite leaves, a few, but um, I'll start with Car Gordino. Oh. No, you, you go ahead, Mr. Chair. Oh, he I think we just we thank the supervisor before he leaves. I know many of us know him in his in his work uh, statewide as well as locally and regionally, and your efforts to really try to look for regional solutions, working with these partners here and others. So I just wanted to acknowledge that, Vito. Okay, now Carl. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair uh, Von Kenneinenberg. This has been excellent and appreciate all of your service and for speaking with us so directly today. I, I was taken right at the beginning with what you shared with us about 80,000 Valley residents commuting to jobs in the Bay Area uh, each weekday. And we all see that on 580 and other uh, and other access points like the Pacheco Pass as well. So one, I wasn't sure if you were solely referring to 580 or if you were also taking into account 152. And if, if, it's, if it wasn't, what are the numbers if we look at both of those corridors or any other corridors? And then I had a more substantive question after that. Sure, the, it's 86,000 and it does include both corridors. The, uh, through the uh, Pacheco Pass as well as through the Altamont. Of course, the Altamont takes the giant share of that, but it's 86,000 from Merced, San Joaquin, and Stanislaus. Great. Andy, thank you. Uh, so the next question, and it's one that our, our California Transportation Commission staff know is a, a real passion of mine as a commissioner, uh, and, and that is how do we continue to work together for the Altamont Pass route to advance the efforts of the Altamont Commuter Express mm -hmm. to extend service from the current Lathrop station first to Ceres and then on to Merced. Uh, and how do we champion that from a state perspective as well as a sub-regional and regional perspective? Well, I'll go ahead and jump in on that one since it's specifically my region. Um, you know, 
great thanks to the state of California. It's invested uh, $400, 400 million dollars from SB1 to get a service down to uh, eventually Merced, and then $500 uh, million dollars from the TRSA program, uh, primarily to get service up to Sacramento. So it's $900 million of uh, expanded uh, capital investment uh, to expand rail service uh, in the northern part of the San Joaquin Valley and into Sacramento. Um, there's still a challenge in terms of uh, being able to address uh, goods movement issues across the Altamont Pass, which are real. Um, distribution centers are going up on a regular basis in light manufacturing in the San Joaquin Valley, in large part due to the uh, differences in cost uh, for land and labor between the Bay Area and the northern San Joaquin Valley. And that's not slowing down. That is actually growing in terms of its increase on that. And we need to figure out better ways to move trucks across the Altamont Pass through um, uh, truck climbing lanes in the westbound direction, um, as well as to address the potential for things like a Valley Link rail service for commuters to get them off of there to provide more room for what's real true economic development uh, transportation services across the Altamont Pass. Uh, we are in the process of, uh, uh, with the help of the Commission, uh, in terms of starting an environmental document for managed lanes on Interstate 205 on the San Joaquin side of this. And uh, I, I do want to give a heads up to our friends uh, from MTC as well as SACOG as we struggle uh, in terms of trying to address the larger transportation issues across the mega region. Uh, as we uh, team together among our three MPOs. Okay, I'll ask for other questions. Okay, I have a few. Um, so, uh, Director Hakimi, you talked about the pilot program for um, uh, the self-driving truck pilot program, electric truck, is that correct? Yeah, yes, Commissioner. Okay, and have, um, so, uh, and, and you've talked to, so how can Caltrans get involved in um, maybe having this be a pilot program that they participate in and maybe get data out of? Well, first of all, the, the, um, I fully expect Caltrans to, to get on board the way Air Resources Board and, uh, and the Air District uh, has gotten on board. First of all, they, they are letting us conduct the, the study and demonstration on their route. And uh, the amount of um, match that we're asking them for is a, a, a very minor amount. And I ex expect them to eventually get on board. What, what I did fail to mention, thank you for mentioning it, though, is, is we are partnering with UC Davis, who we've partnered with before on several other studies to conduct this demonstration and study. OK. Um, next question, this chart here, uh, who, who, who did this chart? This one here the, with the outbound inbound freight. Who was, who was ultimately, what research department did that come out of? So, so that, that was our uh, goods movement study in 2013 uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of our remarks where we studied uh, mostly north-south movement in, okay. in the Central did, Valley. Did, did you did a correlation study on the economic multiplier of the outbound versus the inbound freight in that study as well? No, I, I do not believe we, we okay. have done that. Who helped, who helped develop this, this, this study? What institute? Was, uh, Cambridge Systematics was our was our consultant. Okay, I'd be very curious, and I've I've challenged Caltrans to look at the economic multiplier uh, as they put together the freight mobility plan of the economic uh, multiplier of outbound and inbound freight, and how that um, benefits the the overall GDP growth of the state. So I I if there's any way you can coordinate on that, I'd I'd appreciate that. Um, you all mentioned the, um, the, the commuting patterns, and this is an old, old sheet that was done by the University of Pacific, but it's been updated, and as uh, Director Chesley mentioned, it's now up to 86,000 uh, trips a day uh, into the greater Bay Area. So there's 
two solutions. Well, there's the solution path we're on is uh, doing a multimodal solutions for congested quarters pro program, and that study is underway. And this, uh, you know, the Altamont corridor vision phase one is part of that. Um, you guys have discussed that. The, the downside to this one, which it's a great idea, the downside is it's not fully implemented until 2027. So there's two other ideas that, are, that we've had discussions about, and that is we somehow build a, a large scale amount of, of housing units in the, near the job centers in the Bay Area that are affordable for employees, or we work with those industries that are in the Bay Area to do satellite locations in the Valley. So I'm now going to do something that's probably going to make Carl Gordon uncomfortable. Carl, how do we start that dialogue in a meaningful way in this state? The, you know, we had the dialogue this morning about building more housing units up, up in, um, in near the job centers and, and the challenges to do that. How do we start the dialogue of the alternative, which is how do we put satellite locations for the industries that are in the Bay Area near the housing units so, so we can take these people off the road? Because the, as many of you know, it's not just the, the air pollution and the greenhouse gases that happen here. Those 86,000 people, they're not involved in their community. Those 86,000 people, they're not involved in their kids' school. Those 86,000 people aren't there when their kids come home from school. This is leading to some really long-term social issues in our society. This is not good for our society as a whole. So just saying, okay, we're gonna make the commute cleaner still leaves us with a commute that still has those other social issues coming to our communities, which is a lack of involvement by these people who are commuting. So okay. I, you don't have to have an easy, but I want to, we need to start that dialogue as well, Carl. Sure, so thank you. If you'd like me to speak truth to power, since yeah. I'm looking up to you yeah. and, and your powerful the truth, position. Man. Speak the truth. I try to live by, um, by an expression to be candid but kind. Uh, so Mr. Vice Chair, if you want uh, an honest answer, but a candid but kind answer, I will provide it to you. Um, we are pricing middle class and aspirational middle class and upper middle class jobs out of California by the decisions that we make from a policy perspective. Those are the jobs that we're losing, especially innovation economy jobs that are not industries in place and can go elsewhere in order for those employers to be competitive and survive. So the truth of the matter is a lot of the jobs that you're referencing that can be placed in other locations, go outside of California, but to other states in the United States where they can still be competitive. I'll give you one example since you mentioned housing. The median priced home for a home in the Bay Area last year was 1.25 million. You can buy four times that home for a fourth of the price in Austin at 249,000 or you can buy an even bigger home in Seattle for 496,000 and they'll throw in the umbrella for free. <laughs> that is the case in most innovation economy regions in our country. So we're pricing out the jobs that we say we want for people aspiring to the middle class. And so why aren't they staying in California? Because the same policies that price out those jobs apply to all of California. So it's not a case of, well, why don't you just go to the Central Valley? Because the same state policies apply that make it challenging to do business here, whether you're innovation economy or an industry in place. So it's a much longer conversation that I'll have with anyone over a root beer, since I don't drink, to talk about how do we have policies that meet all of our goals, but also the goals of having jobs for hardworking Californians and people who aspire to work in California. I often say when we're talking about these solutions, most of us, and certainly through my day job, don't expect or want the Central Valley to be the bedroom to Silicon Valley. 
That has never been our solution. We championed, as Andy mentioned in 1998, as the only private sector organization to partner with the public sector to champion uh, ACE's establishment in 1998 because it was already a reality of people suffering through that commute. So how do you respond to that existing reality? We were proud to champion it then. We're proud to champion its expansion now. But that is not the ideal. Bay Area communities need to much better step up to a three-decade-old housing neglect need that we've had in all of California, not just the Bay Area. But that's why we have the pricing challenges for all California families, is because we've neglected as a state to build homes. It's been since 1989, as Hector knows from his days in the legislature, that California has consistently met its annual housing goals just to keep up with our current population each year. And then we wonder why we have a housing price crisis and why we're pricing people out, especially out of our urban areas. And I call it the Texas two-step. In the Bay Area, they first look for a less expensive place in the Bay Area or in the Central Valley, and then they step right out of California. So open to buying lots of root beers for anyone who wants to have this conversation. But we got to stop pointing fingers and joining arms if we're going to be serious about addressing these issues. And so far, a lot of serious people with good intent aren't coming together to address these issues. You always meet my expectations. <laughs> All right. You're very great. Secretary sir. Kim. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, appreciate the panel coming together. I had some, I heard some great insights from all of you. Uh, I'd love your thoughts. This is for any or, any or all of you. Love your thoughts on mobility on demand transit services in rural settings. I met recently with Moses Stites, head of Fresno County Rural Transit uh, Authority, and heard some really promising ideas in terms of what's happening around uh, the rural parts of Fresno County. How do you see this applying in your areas, if it applies at all? What's the future of mobility on demand transit services? And then the second question, not transit related, um, 99 and 5. Uh, I think everybody recognizes the, the role of 99 in the Central Valley as the backbone, as the major arterial. Uh, can you talk about I-5 as well? I know that's to the west of you, but um, what are the similarities and differences in terms of uh, freight traffic on 5 versus 99? Love your thoughts on both questions. Thanks. Uh, let me start, start with I-5, and then I'd be glad to also talk about um, the mobility on demand, too. But, but Interstate 5 was built in the early 1970s in the, in the Central Valley. It's, uh, like I said previously, it's about 225 miles from um, w where it touches down in Kern County after going over the mountains in the Grapevine and uh, up to where it turns off to five, 580. It was built in the early 70s as two lanes, and it's still two lanes today in each direction. Um, you, you all know that our population has, has grown dramatically uh, since the 1970s. You also all know, because I believe most of you drive, that freight traffic has uh, grown exponentially. All of us uh, as uh, directors or employees of MPOs uh, have to consider the growth rates in our county, um, the, the traffic counts. We're, we're all heavily involved with projecting what will happen in the future. And we all know that Interstate 5 in the next 20 years will become what Interstate 5 has become in Los Angeles. It will literally become gridlocked unless we do something uh, very, very soon. And you all know how long it takes to implement uh, transportation projects. Uh, Interstate 5 was always envisioned to, um, to be widened into the median. There, there's enough room without any new um, right-of-way acquisition to widen I-5, but we don't have the resources uh, to do it on our own. Interstate 5 tr uh, carries traffic of national significance. It's the same as uh, Interstate 95 on the East Coast, um, yet we're dealing with a, a, a route that we know 
will fail uh, shortly. I'll, I'll give you a good example. If you drive Interstate 5 on a holiday weekend, like Thanksgiving or, or Christmas, you, you'll see how, uh, what, what engineers call level of services. Uh, you may be moving, but you're moving very slowly. You have limited uh, mobility. We know if we do nothing on I-5, that's what it'll be like every day. And, and we, we want to do something about it, uh, work with you, work with others. It, literally, it will be a, at least a 2 to $3 billion investment uh, to complete Interstate 5. Does that answer your questions? I, if I could add in about mobility on demand. Um, the San Joaquin Regional Transit District for the last eight months has been operating a, what, uh, their Van Gogh program. Is that really kind of clever? They have the vehicles wrapped in, uh, in art from Van Gogh. And uh, it's, uh, there's uh, right now eight vehicles out there that are providing um, service. It generally takes about an hour uh, to actually get out to the location because the demand is so high. Uh, for this service, but it's operating much better than your traditional dial-a-ride uh, service, which generally took 24 hours to get there. Um, we're, there's still some judgments going on about the, uh, the program. It certainly has been meeting the demand of most of the riders uh, out there, but the costs and the um, also issues associated with accessibility are still um, things that need to be assessed around this one. Uh, but I give a lot of credit to the San Joaquin Regional Transit District for actually putting out there, um, they have those eight vehicles, uh, they uh, respond very quickly uh, to uh, requests for rides, um, and uh, uh, up to this particular point from a customer perspective, it's been uh, well received. I would like to add that in Stanislaus Council of Governments in, the, in our area, we have a program called MOVE that is helping our uh, people with disabilities and mobility options that cannot use traditional dial-a-ride services. And that program has expanded. As a matter of fact, when we were passing our measure or working on our expenditure plan, this was something that the, the residents in this, Stanis, in this county wanted the program, and it's been extremely successful. Another program that we're working on, it's the Mio Car, which is a pilot program for, that is going to be targeting underserved communities to try to help people with mobility options in, throughout the county. So. Uh, so we have some new programs that are coming are underway. Let, let me jump in on that Mio car. So in, in, in Kern County, um, w it grew from a grant we received through, I believe, their resources board, and we partnered with UC Davis. So in Kern County, um, we've bought used electric vehicles, to, about two-year-old vehicles, and we're implementing service in Wasco, Arvin, and Lamont, some of our most disadvantaged communities. And I believe it's four four dollars an hour, which is is very affordable for for someone to rent a car for an hour. And it, so far, it is uh, working well. The our goal, at least in Kern County, is to hopefully be able to re replace some fixed route transit systems um, that are are not working well, frankly, with on demand transit. Secretary okay. At this time, we are going. Oh. I'm sorry. Christine, uh, sorry. Okay. So, Secretary Kim, I, I, I heard from Moses about your conversation with him. Uh, he's actually Fresno Cock funded his study about, you know, a program that he's going to uh, look into uh, in the rural areas, uh, looking at mobility on, on demand. Um, but uh, in the entire Fresno, we have a go go grandparent program. Actually, it's that uh, we use the, our local sales manager to fund, uh, to actually to subsidize our seniors for, for their rights. They can, it's actually we use uh, Uber and Lyft. They can actually use the app or they have a 1-800 number to call and they can get the right and they, their right gets, 75% uh, of their right gets subsidized by our local transportation sales dollars. Okay. All right, so now's the time of our program. We're going to break for lunch. Um, for commissioners and board members, you will be going to the San Jose room. Uh, for the rest of the general public, there are one block from here on either 10th or 11th Street. There are several quick serve restaurants, uh, and we will be back here. Can we be back here at 1235, please? 1235.